Good morning. Thank you uh, to our witnesses uh, who are in attendance. Uh, our hearing this morning is entitled Mental Health Bridging the Gap Between Care and Compensation for Veterans. On May 10th, the United States Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit issued a decision that was heavily critical of the care and compensation that VA provides to veterans with mental illness. The court cited VA's unchecked incompetence and the unnecessary grief and privation that delays in treatment and benefits cause veterans and families. I am not here this morning to judge the court's decision. I'll leave that to others. The heart of the court's analysis of the issue is something with which all of us need to be concerned. Namely, is VA's system of care and benefits improving the health and wellness of the veterans that are suffering from mental illness? On behalf of a grateful nation, we've invested heavily in this system over the last decade to improve access and make treatment options that experts say are effective, more readily available. But the question remains, are veterans, especially those returning from combat with the invisible wounds of war, on a road to recovery and able to live full and productive lives. Recovery, education, and wellness. These should be the overarching objective of all VA's programs. When I look at the trends in disability ratings for veterans with mental illness, I see a, a very confusing picture. On one hand, we have a medical system that boasts of evidence-based therapies, improved access, and high quality of care. And on the other hand, we have data from VA indicating that veterans with mental illness only get progressively worse. These confounding facts raise the question, are VA's health and disability compensation programs oriented towards VA's mission of recovery and of wellness? And I'm not the first who's noted this trend or suggested the need for closer integration of VA programs. In 2005, a report from the VA Inspector General concluded the following, and I quote, based on our review of the PTSD claims files, we observed that the rating evaluation level typically increased over time, indicating the veteran's PTSD condition had worsened. Generally, once a PTSD rating was assigned, it was increased over time until the veteran was paid at the 100% rate, close quote. We have a 2007 report from the Veterans Disability Benefits Commission, and we'll hear from the chair of that commission on our second panel this morning. It recommended, quote, a new holistic approach to PTSD should be considered. This approach should couple PTSD treatment, compensation, and vocational assessment, close quotes. Recently, we have the administration raising red flags. In its fiscal year 2010 performance and accountability report, VA commented on how well its Veterans Benefits Administration collaborates with the VHA when providing services to veterans with mental illness. The report suggested that with recovery as the essential goal to helping veterans with PTSD that perhaps VBA and VHA were working at cross purposes. Let me quote from that report. The advent of the recovery model is central to the treatment of mental health and disorders. <laughs> The current system fails to support and may even create disincentives to recovery. Close quotes. Today we're going to move beyond the numbers that simply tell us how many veterans use the system and get into the fundamental <coughs> question of whether they are on the road to leading full and productive lives. For veterans who don't seek VA care, we need to know why they're not seeking that care. We need to know if there are inherent disincentives to recovery. We need to know if the quality of treatment provided at VA is a reason to seek care elsewhere. And we need to know what is effective and what is not effective. Quoting from a recent policy paper from the Wounded Warrior Project, VA's focus on the high percentage of veterans who have been treated begs such questions as how effective was that treatment and how many more need treatment but resist seeking it. And I couldn't agree anymore. It's our duty at this committee to ask these tough questions, and the veterans for whom this system was created demanded of us. We're fortunate to have with us on our first panel Mr. Daniel Hansen, 
Dan served in Iraq, then came home troubled in mind, trying to cope with the loss of so many of his fellow Marines. This is a story I hope everyone listens to closely today as a cautionary tale of where we may be inadvertently headed. Looking back, Dan has some interesting thoughts of what would have taken him, what it would have taken him to get into treatment sooner. And it's just as important, he's got something to say about how he's how he untimely, or ultimately, excuse me, found help outside the VA system. On our second panel, we have Sally Sattel, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. And Dr. Sattel uh, will share with us the principles surrounding what she believes would be a more effective system of care and compensation for veterans seeking mental health treatment. As I mentioned, we also have the former chairman of the Veterans Disability Benefits Commission with us. General Terry Scott. We also have a VA clinician, Dr. Karen Seal, who will share with us her findings on health care utilization of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And finally, on our third panel, we'll hear from the administration and their views and the views of two important, important uh, veterans organizations, AMVETS and the Wounded Warrior Project. I want to thank everybody for coming, members and those in the audience, those that are going to be testifying. And I now yield to our ranking member, Mr. Filner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, taking the leadership on this uh, subject. Of course, uh, we have all raised serious concerns over many years about the backlog of claims. And there are now a record number of service men and women returning home with scars from the war. And now is simply not the time to delay their benefits. The report you mentioned uh, that was released last year by the VA Inspector General Focusing on the delay of our service members getting an appointment for medical exam in order to process their claim for compensation is just one more example of how the VA seems to be failing our veterans. That system has many obstacles for our warriors by putting them through numerous medical exams for each individual ailment for which they are filing a claim. The VA, I think, could easily streamline this process and allow the veteran to receive one complete medical exam to expedite the claims process alleviate the stress on our veterans and save our veterans and taxpayers money. Uh, you mentioned the uh, recent decision by the Ninth Circus, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal in Veterans for Common Sense and Veterans United for Truth versus Shinseki. And uh, that decision, of course, found that veterans have a property interest conferred upon them by the Constitution to both VA benefits and health care and health care. Ruling for the veteran plaintiffs, the Ninth Circuit went a step further to conclude that because there are property interests Delaying access to health care or the adjudication of claims violates veterans' due process rights guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment. Uh, unlike you, who don't want to take a, a judgment on that ruling, I fully support the ruling, and I'm disappointed VA has not done more, more rapidly to fix the problem. We know that every day, 18 veterans in this nation commit suicide. We also know that one in five service members of our current conflict uh, will suffer from PTSD uh, and unfortunately the suicide rate for these brave men and women is about one suicide every 36 hours. Many of them as outlined by the uh, the recent Ninth Circuit court ruling will be left undiagnosed, untreated and uncompensated. This is a travesty and an outrage. Last year the VA Inspector General's office made recommendations for the uh, Veterans Health Administration, the Veterans Benefit Administration to collaborate more effectively and share information on issues affecting the timely delivering, delivery of exams. Uh, I'm disappointed as you are Mr. Chairman that we are still discussing this issue 15 months after those findings and recommendations. The VA is simply not committing sufficient resources to meet the demands of our warriors when they return home. I hope the VA will address these shortfalls and I expect them to come to the table with a plan to fix the problem. And I would uh, you look forward to this testimony. Thank you very much. I uh, would like to call uh, to the witness table Dan Hansen, if you will. Uh, he's joined by his wife, Heather. They're from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, he did join the Marines in 2003. We uh, appreciate you being here, sharing your story. Thank you for your service to our country. You're recognized for your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, in front of the men and women that changed our country. So thank you. 
Um, I'll get into to why I'm here uh, with a brief testimony. Um, grew up in South St. Paul, Minnesota. Came from a, a large family. Uh, went through high school. Eventually uh, joined the Marine Corps after two of my brothers did before me. Uh, I actually thought about joining the Air Force, but uh, they said they would uh, break my arm. But uh, So I joined the Marine Corps and, uh, in 2003. And uh, shortly after, I was deployed to uh, Ramadi, Iraq in uh, 2004. And it was a deployment that started with one of our Marines shooting himself in the head. Um, just kind of brushed that on our table. And then uh, 34 Marines we lost throughout the deployment. Had about 400, 450 Marines injured. Um, came back and uh, went on leave, and, and that was that. Was that. Um, started drinking pretty heavy, um, dealing with nightmares, dealing with things that I wasn't really um, uh, prepared to deal with, I would say. Um, and I think one of the biggest reasons that I uh, dealt with it myself was just because, uh, I mean, I was in a battalion of a thousand Marines, and um, I don't think people wanted to hear, uh, you know, my whining and complaining. So... Um, then shortly after, we went on another deployment, non-combat, which um, um, just kept on drinking, kept on uh, masking my issues with whatever, uh, whatever would take away any of the pain. Came back, and then about six months later, my unit was deployed again to Iraq. Uh, this time, I was in the remain behind element, so I was um, kind of able to see the other side of things when we would get the casualty reports. We would get the uh, KIAs in and have to notify and, and take, uh, you know, uh, be on that end of things as well. Um, I decided uh, that I was going to get out of the Marine Corps, and, uh, but I was persuaded by a, a good friend, Sergeant Major Ellis, to stay in. Um, but on that deployment, he ended up getting killed. Um, I went to his funeral over in Arlington uh, National Cemetery. Then about two weeks after that, a friend uh, also uh, in 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, John Schultz, he hung himself in the basement of his home, and that kind of got me uh, twirling out of control just before I was going to get out of the Marine Corps. And then finally on uh, March, uh, I, I got discharged in February 2007, and then on March 23rd, 2007, um, my brother, who was also in the Marine Corps, uh, he hung himself in the basement of his home, and uh, at that point, I think I, I decided I was going to do everything to avoid uh, pain, um, that I was going to do everything to deal with it myself, as I had been doing for the last three or four years. And I got into uh, drugs. I got into alcohol. I got into um, whatever it was that would mask the pain that day. Uh, eventually, I attempted to kill myself. I ended up in the St. Cloud VA Medical Center for... Uh, about 48 hours in lockup, and then I was released and off to do um, whatever it is that I wanted to do, which was go back to work because that seemed like the normal thing to do after, uh, uh, after something like that. And uh, eventually I found myself in and out of jail. I'm not, uh, and and I, I was getting treated uh, on an outpatient, basement for, uh, outpatient basis for a while at the VA Medical Center. Um, but when you were as messed up as I was, it takes a lot more than one, uh, you know, one or two uh, sessions a week to uh, get through my issues. And so uh, I eventually found, found my way into uh, the dual diagnosis program to get help. It was mostly to avoid a, a longer uh, stint in jail for my DUIs. Um, eventually, um, I got out after about 30 days. I think I started drinking the next day. Uh, about a year later, I found myself in jail for, I don't know, the sixth or seventh time. And I decided for myself that I was done hurting myself, I was done hurting my family, I was done hurting my children. And I uh, checked into a 13 to 15 month faith space program that was uh, what changed my life. About a week after jail, I, I stopped going to work, stopped going to school, and I decided that I wasn't going to be very productive unless I got help. And that's what I did at Minnesota Teen Challenge. Um, it was more of a holistic approach. It was, I, I went to the VA once a week to get help in the combat and the military specific issues. And then uh, I would stay there, you know, um, you know, seven days a week. Um, I, f I wasn't able to get any funding through the VA because it was not, uh, it was not a, a VA funded program. Therefore, I uh, got backed up on bills. I wasn't able to pay things and eventually filed bankruptcy. Um, so in, in my dealings with uh, the VA Medical Center, I always felt like I was in control. I was running my own rehabilitation, although I couldn't even, you know, 
put my shoes and socks on correctly most days. Uh, I felt like it was whatever I wanted to do, uh, Mr. Hansen, whatever I wanted to do that I thought was best for me. Well, I thought what best was for me was to go and get drunk and get high and forget about all my troubles and forget about all my nightmares and pass out with a bottle in my hand. That way I didn't have to deal with any of those issues that uh, were affecting my life. Um, it was uh, something I believe that could have been ended a lot shorter if I would have been able to be forced or somehow um, just, you know, I felt like the VA's role in my treatment over the last several years was more of a friend relationship instead of a parent relationship where it wasn't, hey, you need to do this or else. It was, hey, you know, something's wrong. We got things that can help you. You seem like, you know, you've been through some things. So, well, we, what can we do to help you? So, um I appreciate uh, the time and the honor to speak in front of you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your eloquence. You had a written statement. You didn't even look down at it. Uh, what you said obviously came from experience and from the heart. Thank you for your service to our country. And thank you for your service and your continued desire to not only seek help for yourself, but uh, your fellow veterans uh, who are out there, and I'm 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 interested in your um, in your written statement. Uh, you you said I know that when I was discharged from the Marine Corps, I was not a healthy individual, but I certainly would not have let anyone know that. And I think why do you think it was so hard uh, for for you to speak up about needing help and you know, what can we do uh, as as member of Congress to, to help improve the system, you know, where there is a way to uh, encourage people uh, to seek the help that they need? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I knew I was very messed up when I got out of the Marine Corps. It was apparent. Uh, people told me, you're not the same person, you're angry. Um, and I was drinking and I was, I, was, uh, I was depressed and it was apparent to me. I, and to go back a little bit, in the Marine Corps, my primary MOS was an 0151, which is administrative in nature. So I was uh, attached to 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, a grunt unit sent to Iraq. So I immediately felt like I didn't deserve to get help because I, I, I wasn't 03. I wasn't infantry by trade. So therefore, the things that I saw were things that are natural, and, and therefore, you know, I just kind of need to suck it up. So as when I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, you know, I, I started seeking treatment at the VA, and I just, I felt like I didn't get help because if I admitted that there was something wrong with me, there was something wrong with me. And the VA, though they were there and they were supportive, they never really said, this is what's going to happen if you continue and you don't get help. You need to get help. Or if you don't get help, you're not going to get this disability check that, you know, you go and spend on booze and, and the strip club, to be very frank. Um, and, and that's what I, I did. And so I think the biggest reason I didn't get help was because I, I felt ashamed. I felt like I didn't. I, there was another bed for someone more deserving than myself. So that, that was the main reason, Mr. Chairman. You raised two important issues in your testimony. At first, you said that although you needed to get help, you chose not to get it because, and this was your, your words, I was able to afford not to. Uh, and I think it'd be important for, for you to explain what you meant by that. And, and then also, how common do you think that is uh, for individuals uh, not to seek help because uh, they have other avenues in which, which they can go? And, and also, how many uh, out there uh, who need help but don't get it because they can afford uh, not to? I mean, do you think it's a large group? Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman. I. I obviously don't have an, uh, an exact number, but I, I have plenty of friends that I feel, you know, you get their disability check and, and they're comfortable with it. They, they get it for, for, you know, whether it's a, uh, a mental illness or a physical illness. And a, a lot of the goal is to, to get it bumped up. And that way you don't have to, you know, it's, you know, $800, $1,000 that you don't necessarily have to, I shouldn't say work for, but it, it makes life easier. And for me, as you said, I, I could afford not to because... It, it was kind of supporting my my uh, my alcohol problems. My it, and I'm not saying I mean it's helped me tremendously. But when I was in the in my mix, when I was unhealthy and making poor decisions, it was just a way for me to support my addiction essentially. And and I know plenty of people that um, that I was friends with and that I served with that 
you know, it's kind of the same thing where it's it's a convenience thing and it, you know, pays certain bills and it does certain things. So why why get help when that'll take away from the money you're making every month, essentially? Money that goes in the bank. Filmer. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. I know it's not easy to talk about your own life here, but uh, in your written testimony, you do mention certain things you think the VA could do to you and your comrades better. Can you want to go over those a little beside the one you just mentioned to the chairman? Yes, sir. I felt um, that, that very often it was just kind of like I was a number, another number in a revolving door. I never felt there was much of an actual care. Um, whereas when I eventually did go to Minnesota, Minnesota Teen Challenge, I felt there was an actual effort for me to get help, to get better, not because of it was their job, because it was something they were passionate about. And that was a big part of it for me. And, and another big part of it for me was I was able to go to the VA Medical Center to get help once a week, but then I was removed. I didn't, I didn't have to be the, the Marine, the combat veteran every time I went back to get help. I, was, I wasn't around a lot of veterans, and I can understand that there's a certain benefit to it, but there was also a benefit to not being with, with all the people that know what I went through. There was, a certain, uh, how do I, there was a certain part of it that not being around people that didn't know what I went through was beneficial. I, di I didn't have to put on this, you know, macho man, yeah, I, you know, I'm this tough guy, which I'm not. So it was a lot easier not to act most of the time. And I think that was a big part of it. A, a big part of it for me was being removed from a lot of the people that has been through the same things as, as I did myself. And, um, and there's, there's also certain uh, other parts about the VA where I just don't feel they have any, at least for me, I was able to go to the dual diagnosis program, which is in St. Cloud VA Medical Center, which is 30 to 90 days. I mean, after years and years of abuse, and years and years of just masking my problems, I needed more than 30 to 90 days. I needed 13 to 15 months, and that's, that's what did it. And although it was painful at times and I hated it most of the time, it was a reason I did. I wasn't able to get comfortable, and I wasn't able to just um, pretend that everything was all right because eventually things are going to come out, and sometimes it takes time, and that's what I needed. Dr. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Hansen, for being here today and giving some, uh, I think, very um, tough testimony uh, for what you've done. And, and how are things going now for you? Uh, things are going great, sir. I, I'm going to school full-time, working on another bachelor's degree. I'm married. I have children. Um, I serve uh, people instead of taking away. I live a life to, you know, volunteer for veterans. Uh, I'm a Veterans Affairs Liaison at Minnesota Teen Challenge. I'm able to affect people in a positive way and for all the years I took away, give back. So uh, I'm very, very, very happy for uh, the turnaround in my life. And so it's great to hear that. And, and uh, I know it's tough to, um, to lose friends. I certainly understand that as a, a veteran and, and having done the same thing myself, it's very hard to talk about. And, uh, and, you, and you deal with it every day. I'm sure you think about these men that you lost, friends that you knew every day. And I, I don't do you, do you feel any guilt for surviving and they didn't? Is that an issue with you? Do you feel that? There, there was a, a particular incident in which, um, yeah, I've, uh, it was a lot of uh, survivor's guilt that I, I dealt with um, when I was supposed to uh, go and inspect a VBID and we got called off. Another unit came and they ended up uh, losing seven Marines and I was the lead vehicle. And, and then as we pulled away, you know, we got, you know, swore at and told that, you know, we should be the ones. And I, I don't want to bring stuff like that up. But, yeah, there was a lot of survivor's guilt that I dealt with. And, and, and that was, uh, you know, what drove at times my drinking quite, you know, considerably. I think that probably had something to do with a lot of folks. I, I want to hear a little bit more about how your faith-based, how the program you felt was successful for you. I think that's really important because obviously every, everybody's different, but this this clearly worked with you, and I think you had made your mind up too that you were going to change your life. I think it had a lot to do with you also. Yes, sir. I mean, I was at the point where it, it was, either, I mean, I was on my knees in my jail cell praying, and I said, you know, God, either use me or kill me. And uh, I eventually went to Teen Challenge. And, and the reason I feel that was so effective was it was more of a holistic. I mean, I was such an immoral, uh, I used to say social parasite where, you know, I was a liar. I was, you know, an alcoholic. I was a, I was a deadbeat dad, essentially. And when I went into Minnesota Teen Challenge, I was able to deal with the moral 
and the and not just the things that happen in combat, but going all the way back to childhood and you know some of those issues and get to the the heart. And for 13 to 15 months, you know you're going to get through a lot of the issues. I still have issues, but they are considerably less. And I mean, it was physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing. It, it, it was uh, you know a mental healing, and it was like I, I said, more of a holistic pro, uh, approach of of getting help for not just what happened when I was in the Marine Corps, but before and after and the, and the damage I had done and the survivor's guilt and knowing that, um, you know, what happened happened, but I have a future and I have the chance to make the best out of it. And that's what I intend on doing now. Well, you've obviously done a great job with that and, and a, a real asset, not only as a, as a soldier and a Marine, but as a, as just a citizen of the country and as father. Um, and, and again, to the chairman and the, and the, Mr. Fillner's question, uh, how do you think the VA could, could use some of the experiences you've had to make it better for other uh, uh, Marines or soldiers or airmen who have experienced the same thing? Well, I, I definitely feel that at times if, if I would have got the kick in the butt I needed to get into to rehab where, where the VA would have said, look, either you go, to, you go to rehab, you get better, or, you know, you're... <laughs> You're not welcomed here. Basically, you know, if you don't want to use what we have set up for us, then, you know, maybe you should use somewhere else. Because if there's people that really want to get help, this place needs to be open for those individuals. And for years, I, I, I had uh, great opportunities to get help, but I, I didn't because I didn't want to. And, and I think if the VA, you know, instead of a friendship role, took that parent role, where I know there's plenty of times when my dad made choices where I, you know, I hated him for it at the beginning, but I saw the absolute, you know, necessity of it, you know, years down the road, uh, I appreciated it much more, uh, obviously, instead of, you know, him not parenting me. And I'm not, it's a weird analogy to use as a VA as a parent, but I just think if the VA would be possibly more assertive in their treatment and saying, look, you're obviously messed up, you've been through this, you've been through this, you have this police record, it's time to either get help or, you know, find somewhere else to, to try to get help. T tough love. Again, tough thank love. you so much for your service to our country. Thank you, sir. Mr. Michaud, you recognize five minutes. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you, Mr. Hansen, for your service uh, to this uh, great nation of ours and for, uh, for coming here today because I know, as the others mentioned, it cannot be easy for you to do that. Uh, uh, my questions, uh, a couple of questions is, first of all, how did you find out about uh, the Minnesota uh, a team, a, a challenge, a, a program. I um, I was actually in jail. I had gotten my 700th DUI, it seemed like, and I made a phone call to to uh, tell my uh, sister to pick up my son for a trip to Wisconsin Dells, and I saw an advertisement on the wall, and then my brothers picked me up from jail, and I heard an advertisement on the radio. For Minnesota team, and I said, "Okay, well, I think that's a sign." And a week later, I, I told work, "I, I got to go get better, and and I'll be gone for a year." So, uh, that was how I heard about it. And, and my family had had known about it because um, it, it is a faith-based program, and my mom's a, a very uh, religious person, and so she had mentioned it actually uh, in the previous. But I said, "Come on, 13 to 15 months, I got things to do. Let's go here." So, thank you. Uh, on the um uh, do you think uh, that it would be more beneficial for those who are serving uh, in the military today if actually before they're discharged uh, that they actually are aware of different programs out there and trying to uh, you know, get some of those service while you're actually in the service versus once you're discharged uh, uh, from the military? Uh, yes, sir, absolutely, 100%. I know when I was... Uh, you know, back from Iraq, and I still had a couple years left in the Marine Corps, and I had really no idea. You know, I, I could have spoke to the chaplain or went to the, the battalion aid station or something like that, but other than that, I really had no idea what I would do if, if I really wanted to get help. So I wasn't really in the mindset of getting help, but if, I think if I would have been more aware and, and I would have been, uh, you know, um, under the understanding that a lot of people did it and I wouldn't have been the only one and it wasn't weird or you know, weak for me to do that, I would have been much more apt to do it and get the help before I got discharged and, and uh, you know, put, put, saved a lot of uh, pain and suffering for my family and my children, my, my, my wife. So. And how do you think those services would be more beneficial? For instance, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan several times 
in every trip that I been to Iraq and Afghanistan, when I talk to the generals and uh, uh, ask them if they need help, particularly with those who have uh, traumatic brain injury or severe post-traumatic stress disorder, what do they need? We get the same answer. Well, they've got the resources they need to take care of them. But the interesting thing is, on one of those trips, had someone with much lesser rank uh, approached me, uh, pulled me aside, said they need a lot more help. And one of the su suggestions uh, that they actually made was uh, that I talk to the clergy. And so since that trip to Iraq, every trip I've taken since then, I did talk to the clergy. And the interesting thing is they were telling me that more and more of the soldiers are going to them because they were afraid to seek help uh, from uh, from, from a doctor because uh, they're afraid what other uh, of the soldiers would um, say. Uh, do you find that true uh, uh, as well, that they might be afraid to actually seek help while they're in the, uh, the service because of uh, they might not get the promotion that uh, they're looking for? Uh, yes, sir, absolutely. I feel like it, it, it needs to start probably from the top on down because when you are in a unit like that and, you know, you you take out take the risk of asking for help i mean you, you you might be considered a broken marine or you might be considered someone that you know isn't ready for the next promotion or isn't ready to lead marines or you know be put in that billet in which um you have a lot more responsibility from then on out i think the if you were to do that i, I feel like yeah you would be putting yourself at risk because you're you're basically looked as possibly as like a, someone that's broken and that that is no good to them or or be given a job you know as you know cleaning toilets or something like that and that's probably not the case in every unit but i know um definitely in my unit i i would have been probably terrified to actually ask somebody for help and to say hey i'm having nightmares or i'm having issues like that because i would have felt like that would have been the start of just uh, a domino effect of of you know, discussions about where I'm headed and my next rank and, and my cutting score and things like that, sir. So I definitely feel like if there needs probably to be a, an atmosphere of that's all right, you know, but then where do you draw the line? Does, is everyone going to be raising their hands? I'm sure that's going to be the next question asked. But um, I think that definitely is where it starts is the, t the top on down. And because I worked pretty closely with our RP and our chaplain and they had someone in there every single day. But if you would have possibly asked a sergeant major or somebody else, they, they probably would have had no idea. It, my, my last question, and everyone's different. And you mentioned uh, when you went to the VA uh, that it was more of a, a friendship type of uh, a situation versus a, being a, a parent type uh, situation. Uh, and when, especially when you're dealing with traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress, I think individuals react differently. Uh, and my next question is, and, and last question is, uh, actually there was a report the Inspector General had done actually with the, a Marine uh, the, that they in investigated whether or not the VA provided uh, this particular Marine uh, the proper health care that uh, he deserved. And, and actually it uh, came out that in fact it was not the case. Uh, and primarily, it probably was a different situation uh, than yours, where the VA actually was going to cut the disability benefits uh, from this Marine, and it pretty much, I think, uh, uh, put the Marine over the edge as far as he's lost his benefits versus, you know, how can we better serve, uh, the, you know, this particular individual. Uh, so in your comments about you need that tough love, so to speak, uh, do you think uh, that would be the case in, in every situation or should uh, the VA look more at uh, the individual and uh, more or less take down the silos between the, uh, the benefits versus the VHA and the healthcare side? Uh, do you think they should look differently at different uh, situations versus saying, well, you got to show that tough love in all cases? Yes, sir. I, I definitely agree. It's on a case-to-case -case basis. And for me, I was uh, financially secure enough where if they would have uh, get shown the tough love and said, we're going to cut you off, it, I mean, I would have been able to survive and it would have angered me and I probably would have had some, some harsh words to say, but I would have been able to, uh, I'm, I'm sure it would have forced me into some sort of rehab and, and, um, and I think that would have helped, but I, I definitely agree with you where there is some circumstances where 
you know, people uh, are not abusing that compensation and, and they do still need help, but there's other, there's, I'm sure there's other ways to go about it than just cut compensation. But I think for some people like myself, it would have been beneficial to do so. Um, but for some, but for some people, I, I agree that it's not the best route to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stutz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Hansen, for being here. Your testimony is uh, just, it's an amazing story, and uh, it's so good to see you here and uh, taking the opportunity to share with us your experiences and um, what you've experienced, uh, not only in the military, but also after the military and in, uh, in how you're finding success. Um, like, also to your wife, I know she's, uh, she's been through a lot as well. I can tell she's very proud of you sitting back. Um, my question is, is after you... Uh, left the military. Did the VA ever give you any uh, direction on two programs? You mentioned that you heard about Teen Challenge um, on the on the radio and on a uh, ad. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm familiar with Teen Challenge. In fact, one of my best, well, a good friend of mine growing up uh, hit, you know, the bottom in his life and, and actually found a lot of success at Teen Challenge. So I'm, it's really encouraging to hear this. Um, but did they give you any direction of, of different programs, um, any ideas on where to find help, anything like that? They, uh, when I did uh, finally decide that I needed to uh, get help and, and they, you know, they were supportive and saying, yeah, you should find a place. They, they offered VA treatments, which was, um, was the dual diagnosis program in St. Cloud VA Medical Center that was 30 to 90 days. And then they offered um, an outpatient one at uh, the Minneapolis VA Medical Center that was, I believe it was six weeks and it was um, Monday through Friday, something like um, 8 a.m. to, to 4, 4 p.m. But also, you know, at the dual diagnosis program, I was able to leave in the weekends. So, you know, I, I'm there Monday through Friday inpatient the whole, the whole week. But then on the weekend, I'm able to get out and, you know, do whatever I really want to do. So I think that was also a part of the reason I, I didn't get as much, you know, gain as much success from that program as well, because I was given that freedom. And, and uh, it's what I wanted, but freedom wasn't what I needed at the time. Mm -hmm. I needed... Uh, you know, a swift kick in the butt and, 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 and some serious help. So those were the two programs that they offered to me. They were both um, VA funded and, and through the VA. And, and so Team Challenge, you were there 24-7, committed for almost a year. Yes, sir. I, I lived there. There's special occasions where, you know, if uh, you can get a couple of days where you go on a pass or something like that. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, you're there 24-7. You wake up uh, and you... <laughs> You get breakfast, you, I worked out, and you go to chapel, and, and then for the second half, you're doing chores, you're doing all those things, but you're there every single day. And, and like I said, it, it was nice because I was there. I was able to go to the VA for treatment and then come back to a safe place, a safe environment where I could be my own self, which wasn't, you know, Dan Hanson, Marine, combat veteran. I was just Dan, and, and I think that was a big part of it for me. You mentioned in your testimony that one of the biggest struggles that you dealt with was not having the funds to complete the program. What kind of cost did that... Uh uh, did it take to attend the program for one year? For, for a year, it was about 850 to about 850, 860 dollars a month, and so I had other priorities at the time that I was trying to pay for, and 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 yeah, I, there was times I got you know I was behind in my payment to Minnesota Teen Challenge, and uh, it, I asked them several times to uh, to try to fund the program, but they said that was not possible because mm -hmm. um, that was a program that didn't fund, and then I try to. Uh, do some other things, and eventually um, they bumped my service connection after I was done with the program, but by that time I was behind on all sorts of bills, and um, you know, it, it was a little bit of a disaster financially. Did you meet any other veterans in the program by chance? Yes, the, I met uh, some Vietnam veterans that, um, you know, were really struggling, that had been struggling for 30 years. I met um, OIF, OEF veterans. Granted, there wasn't a lot of them, but, you know, there was a handful of them. And, and, and that's why I still do work with um, Teen Challenge to get, veteran, you know, to, to get veterans in there. And uh, I know that the veterans that I, you know, have had in there and that went through the program, it's a little bit easier because the structure is almost, you know, like the military where you wake up, you go to bed when they tell you, and you there's, there's strict rules. If you want to get in a fight, you're, you're gone. It's, there's nothing to talk about. And it was something where I fit in very well because of the structure and was able to excel. Very good. So about 10000 a year then for the program. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll yield back.
Sergeant Major. Walt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Hanson, thank you as a fellow Minnesotan. Uh, you go to South St. Paul High? Yes, sir, I did. I coached football there many times oh. from Mankato West, so we probably played against you at some Yeah, point. I believe we won most of the time. So. I think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for adding that. <laughs> but, uh, again, uh, thank you for your service, and, again, uh, there's not words that we're going to share with you that are going to... Uh, to ease that pain other than for you to recognize that we take our responsibility very seriously here. So you're coming here and your family, your wife coming, uh, uh, hugely important. And I'm certainly not going to tell you that in 2003 and, and in the early stages of, uh, of this current conflict, we were ill-prepared for the influx of veterans. We did not have that. Uh, what I would say is, is this issue that I think we're getting at, and I think it's very important, and, and the next panel I will... Uh, discuss some uh, issues on the case for coercion versus autonomous uh, care. But for you on this, it obviously worked, and that's what we want. One veteran that, that, that succeeds is what we're after. My uh, approach to this, and I see this and I take it very seriously as a senior NCO, you're right, this culture of how you seek care and how you get your soldiers into that. This is, I think we need to keep in mind, this is a broader issue, and Minnesota has a long legacy in this with uh, former Senator, or late Senator Wellstone and former Congressman Jim Ramstead on this idea of uh, mental health parity, something we fought for hard, that this idea that you should be treated for mental health issues just as if you'd lost a leg in those care. And uh, we're trying to get this right. We're trying to, and I think what's coming up, Mr. Michaud brought up, um, I think Mr. Stoltzman talking a little bit about this individualized care, how do we get that right? One of the things we have to be concerned with is evidence-based policy and those types of things. Uh, since you first testified over in the Senate side, have you used the VA for anything? Yes, sir. I, when I was in Minnesota Teen Challenge, oh, that was, I apologize, that was after. I have, very loosely, I've met with a psychiatrist, Dr. Brown, who has seen me since I got out in 2007, um, and, and I've met with him, and just kind of talked about things, and then I've done physical therapy for my back and neck. But as far as mental health goes, um, I've pretty much done no, no, no follow-up okay. as far as that goes whatsoever. And, the, and, and I want to assure you and make sure you know, as, as Minnesota's only member of the delegation that, that's on this VA committee, uh, I spend a lot of time at those. And, and three weeks ago, I was up at St. Cloud. I was in the in-treatment facility there and met with Dr. Ball and uh, the administrator and, and talk a lot. I want you to know that, that I take the job very seriously of seeing what's working there. And, and I think it's important to know that uh, we are having successes there, which you, you've got friends that have probably gone through there um, and, and we're having that. I also want you to know uh, any time there's a failure in any way, uh, my job is to get the end of it. And with Jonathan Schultz, I have spent, and my staff has spent countless times understanding what happened there, where things went wrong, where we could have done better, what the outcome was. And uh, you need to know that you coming here and testifying uh, gives us the, uh, the motivation, if you will, makes it very clear to us what our job is to try and deliver. And what we're trying to figure out is how do we best treat and care for folks like yourself? How do we do it in a way that respects your personal freedoms and your rights? Uh, but, but how do we make sure that, that you are given the opportunities to enter back in society? And I think you keep bringing up a very good point, and I hope the committee does, this holistic approach. I'm very concerned with the employment issue. You know this as well as anybody. A good job's a good way to start getting better, if you can get that and hold on to it in conjunction with therapy, in conjunction with a family that's committed. One of the problems we have is uh, we, we've let some of those programs for hiring veterans lapse, and we need to bring them back again but uh, you're working now right no sir well I do do some uh, work it's volunteer uh, for uh, Minnesota Teen Challenge as a Veterans Affairs liaison but I do go to uh, school full-time at Northwestern right. College so right. using GI Bill using the post 11 GI it's Bill working for you it's working great for me sir. so those benefits get you by you're able to provide your wife and family you're able to get by where you're getting your education uh, provide your housing food and things like that yes sir I I could I'm sure I would have no problem getting a job right now it's just I want to use the post 9/11. What if those bet? What if those benefits were held back until you got treatment? The post 9 that was that's a very good point because I um, all the way up until I went into Minnesota Teen Challenge, I was utilizing those. I was going to um, school full time, and that the biggest reason was I, I did want more money, and I was yeah. getting disability. But I was also hey, I can go to school full time and get this money. But if that was held back, I think that would have really um, done a good job of. Uh, pointing me in the right direction saying okay they're they're serious now so. for you the holding it back would have uh would have motivated you to it absolutely if they would have said you can't go to school and we're going to pay for it until you get help because you're clearly um if you we look back in your history and and in your doctor's appointments you you need help and, and here's your incentive you want to go to school 
go get help. To this is an issue I'm very interested in. I've been uh, spending a lot of time reading the literature on this to try and see uh, overall how many times that works or what it does. So uh, that's helpful to me. Again, uh, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your service. I appreciate your courage in uh, in coming forward talking about these issues. And I assure you, I think. Uh, I think we've learned during this conflict, at least I'd like to believe this, I think especially as senior NCOs, we're, we're getting better at seeing this, this issue of uh, mental health parity and, and early treatment while the wounds are fresh is the best way to go instead of just uh, sending you back to fend for yourself. So that, that's not the right way to do it. So thank you for that and thanks to your family. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Dr. Beneshek, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanson, thank you so much. Uh, I want to commend you on your courage for being here today and, and providing us with that testimony because I can uh, tell it, it wouldn't be easy for me to give that story if it was me. So uh, I really commend you and, and your wife for being here today, and, and I appreciate uh, the education. Um, I just have a couple of simple questions. Uh, was there any kind of, when you're discharged from the Marines, is there any sort of a mental health evaluation upon discharge um, or would you have you been willing to you know talk about your problems upon discharge so you could get help I mean I, I was curious about how it was you were reluct reluctant to seek attention because you, you felt embarrassed about it T tell me more about that discharge process yes so there's there's a final physical in which you go through to make sure when you are discharged that you know you're you're a hundred percent you know you know, well as when you join the Marine Corps. Um, and then if you're not, then you get hooked up with the VA. But for me, I, I passed my final physical and they, you know, it, it was easy for me to say, yeah, I don't have nightmares, I don't have this. And that's what I did. You fill out a form and they say, are you going through any of these things? And you just circle no and, and that's really, that's really that as far as that goes. And they have a, the temp and tap program, which is about, I think, four days. And that's about, you know, you know, integration back into to society. Uh, with civilians and but for the final physical and temp and tamp it's really you go through um, the physical part of it and then the mental stuff you fill out some paperwork and for me I just pretty much X no on everything and that was that they didn't uh, really ask me any follow-up questions they didn't go any deeper into it they just said okay it looks on the you know on the paper that you're doing you're doing pretty good so you just basically didn't tell the truth in that and yes sir okay and then no one really questioned you about it or you didn't have a evaluation with someone sitting down talking about them no sir they just basically had me fill out the paperwork and said uh, looks like you you're doing well and I said yes uh, let me get out of the Marine Corps now all right <laughs> yeah another question I have is um, tell me more about what you're doing with this uh, with this group this team challenge group what, what exactly are you doing for the other sure. Marines or with, with team challenge basically I go to different um, you know uh, Either, whether it's like VA, like the uh, stand down, the VA stand down, or I'll go to any um, sort of veterans event and I'll have a table and I'll just try to, you know, get the word out that, hey, this is a great place um, for veterans. It's a good, it's a good option. It worked for me. Here's my story. I'd like uh, to see more people going, going through that. So anywhere I can, like um, I'm testifying um, at a court case on Friday about trying to get um, someone sentenced there instead of prison, essentially. He was, he's a, a combat veteran struggling with PTSD, and they want to send him to prison. So any, anytime I can speak at things like that, get a hold of someone that, you know, is a combat veteran or just a veteran, not just a veteran, but a veteran, and try to steer them into this long-term care because I feel the key is is the long-term care. And for me, I, I put it off for as long as I could, but I know I would not be where I am today unless it was a year-long program, in which it was. So that's essentially what I do for Teen Challenge. Just get go to events, um, recruit any way I can, uh, network, and try to get a hold of veterans that are hurting and get them into the program. Thank you very much for your testimony, and I'll, I'll yield back the remainder of my time. Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Daniel, I, I want to thank you, like every member of this panel, for serving our country and for sharing your insights. And this is, uh, you're, you're sharing stuff with us that I haven't really heard before, so uh, it's useful. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the teen challenge. Uh, it's obviously not aimed at veterans. Is that correct? It is, is, it is not, sir. It's uh, for just normal, non-veterans. I'm a little unclear about the relationship between the VA and the Teen Challenge. Were, were, were those two organizations able to work to make the program work for you, or was it just something you had to fight through? 
No, they Minnesota. It was more Minnesota Teen Challenge working with the VA. The VA was open for me to do um, a program while I was in Teen Challenge. So essentially, uh, I had to get it approved by Minnesota Teen Challenge because they have their rules and they have their you know Monday through Friday everything planned out. But I was able to ask them, you know, can I go to this? It was cognitive processing therapy. It was about three months. So three months out of the year that I was there, I was able to go to the VA, go meet with uh, my uh, psychologist, then I'd go to a group meeting with some other veterans, and then, um, then I would be sent back to, back to the program. So it wasn't really much of a working relationship. I, was, I would say it was Teen Challenge saying, yes, if you want to go there one day a week, you can do that, and then the VA setting up a, a program for that. So there could be better cooperation between the VA and some of these community-based operations. Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. And that was something I struggled with and it's something I continue to try to help with when I graduated the program was uh, being more open to a program like this. And because every time I, I try to talk to uh, people, you know, someone at the VA about, hey, this is a great program. Will you fund this? Or, you know, can we, can I put up a, you know, you know, a sign for people, you know, it was just, they didn't want anything to do with it because it's not a government funded program. Mm. And, and that's understandable, but um, it, I feel it's a great program, and hopefully someday there can be a better relationship there. Well, I'm sure uh, my office would be love to would love to work with you on developing an idea on how to make that happen, or anyone on this panel would. I can guarantee you. So, uh, if you feel like you want to do that, any of our offices would be open. Uh, my office would specifically. Now, uh, about Teen Challenge, you were you compelled to stay there? Were, did you have to stay there? No, sir, I did not have to stay there. I, I could have left. There are certain people that are, um, as I said to Dr. Benshek, that are required, they're court ordered there. But for myself, I checked myself in, therefore I could leave at any time. And there was plenty of times I thought I was going to leave, but um, I stuck through it and, um, you know, pushed through a lot of the pain. Well, the interesting thing is that you had decided that you wanted to go through the program, that you needed help, that you had reached rock bottom, or whatever decision had come to you that you wanted to do this program. Uh, would there be any way to uh, compel folks that didn't want to go through that program, that needed help as you did, to go through the program? Yes, sir, I believe so. There's a program that is part of Minnesota Teen Challenge. It's called the Extended Care Program. That's a 30 to 90 day program. And then if you feel like you're not, um, you're not where you need to be, then you can transition right over into the year-long program where those 90 days that you were already there count towards your year-long stay. So you can get basically a, a small part of what the program is about through the 30 to 90 day program, see if it's a good fit for you. If it's not, you complete the shorter term program and you can leave. But if you feel like this is what I need, I'm getting the help I need here, then you just transition right over into the long-term program. Well, I'm really glad to hear about this. Uh, we just had a case, a tragic case where a young man had a three-day program, and he, he left, and he walked in front of a train that afternoon, a few hours after he was released. Mm -hmm. So clearly that wasn't giving him what he needed. He had been through several two-week uh, programs that didn't help. So uh, now I, I see the, the value of that. So thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, sir. Mr. Runyon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Hanson, for your uh, service to this country and I think many people a lot of times fail to recognize that the sacrifice is lifelong and I think you're a prime example of that in dealing with this. Um, another thing you, you touched on earlier and going back to the VA stuff, the lack of being a parent. Um, sometimes here on the Hill we have a lack of ability to have adult conversations a lot of times. And I think you see that trickling down into the administration throughout. It, we're, you know, we're treating veterans, but we're not treating veterans. You know what I'm saying? There? Yes, we're, not, we're not solving the problem. Particularly to your situation, as you said, you were in the program and, you know, you're allowed to go home on the weekends. Was there, obviously, we know the, the mental issues are underlying but there's also a, a substance issue that was there also. Was that being addressed at all on, say, you come in on a Monday morning? Is that being addressed? Or they just kind of say, uh, oh, whatever happened on the weekend happened? No, they, they would do, um, like, urine tests when, I, when we would come back from the weekend and certain things like that. Um, but And we did. They had AA meetings at, at the program and things like that as well. 
but uh, kind of like you said, I feel like it was it was a setup program, and and while I was there, it wasn't very structured around my individual needs. You know, I I agree with you. There is an addiction problem, uh, 100%. But for me, I think it was much more emotional. You know, I was you know a sensitive guy, and and I needed uh, something uh, to address those much more than I did my alcohol. And that's I felt like solely what it, it was either it was either about the alcohol or it was either about the combat. It wasn't about some of the other issues like the guilt. Sure, that ties in with it, but uh, specifically the guilt and the shame and the hate I had for myself, I, it was never really addressed whatsoever. And I and I and I. I know what you're saying, but uh, sometimes I think most people agree with me. It's hard to get to the root of those issues until we get the chemicals out of the way. Absolutely. And and I don't think there's, you know, there needs to be, as you say, specifically tailored to your issue. Obviously, your issue kept ballooning and ballooning on the substance issue. We can't treat the the mental issue until we get the 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 drugs and the alcohol out of the way. And it, I, I think it was a it was a shortcoming on the on the VA's on their program within it when it's within itself there and it was yes sir and, and going back to your question actually you know we we would be released on friday afternoon well you can drink friday night saturday night as long as you stay off the bottle for sunday you come in and you'll take a you know you'll have a clear urinalysis test so absolutely i agree with you where you know these were in there for for a chemical uh, addiction yet you know we have the opportunity to drink for a couple of days go back look like it's all clear not talk about it pass the urinalysis test and keep on going I think that says it all and uh, with that I yield back chairman I thought you were leaning back I couldn't see you behind the uh, sergeant major there sir <laughs> I thank the chairman, and with my thanks to the witness and all those he represents, I'll defer to my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hughes-Camp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I additionally want to thank uh, Mr. Hansen for his courage of being here and uh, sharing his, uh, I think part of this is a faith testimony. I appreciate that. And I, I come from a very rural district in, in western Kansas, and this is a story I've heard from a number of um, my constituents as well as family members. So I believe your presence here today hope will, will save lives and hopefully change things better at the VA. And with that, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Bill Arrakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your service, sir. Appreciate it very much, and thank you for your testimony. Just a couple quick questions. What's the greatest barrier you saw in, uh, in getting treatment? Really, just getting past the myself. I uh, I knew the options were there, but was uh, I I was working full time. I was going to school full time. I had a life. I wanted a party. So it was getting past. It was getting past the inconvenience of having to get help, whether it be outpatient or inpatient. Most certainly, inpatient was out of the question. So that is why, for some time, I did outpatient care because uh, there was times I felt like you know I'd walk out of there feeling better, but. Um, certainly the biggest barrier was myself getting past um, being able to control whether I get help or not was the biggest thing because I didn't want to be inconvenienced because I, I knew what was right for me at the time. How about uh, what can the VA do to further encourage treatment? I think uh, as I touched on a little bit earlier I think just maybe being a little bit more forceful in their approach saying you know, not just saying we have these rehab programs, um, you're definitely a good candidate for them. In instead saying, you know, we have these re rehab programs and you need to get help. And, it, you know, if you don't get help, I mean, there's going to be some sort of consequence. And I guess I don't know if it should be, you know, financial or, or, or you can't get help there. But I just feel like once a person, it's clear that they need help, possibly somehow it should be not just an, a good idea between myself and the psychiatrist or the psychologist I'm talking to. It should be something more where it, more assertive, more, more take charge kind of, you're, you're messed up, we're going we're gonna to get you into treatment one way or another. Not, not just giving me um, options as you're a good candidate for, for help. You need help. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it, Mr. Thank Stern. you, sir. Yield back. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, let me again reiterate what my colleague said, Mr. Hansen. Uh, we appreciate your service and your willingness to come here and to really be honest and candid with us. Uh, when I read 
through your opening statement, you indicated that when you were discharged from the Marine Corps, you knew you were not a healthy individual. But at the same time, you did not tell anybody. And there was a feeling, I guess, in your own mind, you said it in your opening statement, that you felt indestructible, uh, that because you were in the, in the Marine Corps and, and yet you had served, yet you were struggling. Uh, you suggested that perhaps everyone should uh, realize that they should get some help uh, and perhaps as an incentive to have compensation withheld. Let me ask you this. Do you think if you not talk about the VA, but talk about the military services, uh, do you think the Marine Corps itself should have briefed you before you were discharged to say, look, it's not being less of a Marine if you realize you need help and that somehow this uh, feeling, not just in the Marine Corps, but all the military, that you are weak if you say, I need help. So I've been to these hearings before, and generally I find that persons like yourself are courageous, are willing to give your life for your country. And so when it comes to signing on the dotted line that I'm weak and I need help, people won't do it because they say it's a sign of weakness in America. So had you ever thought, I know you, you suggested that as an incentive to, to not with, to, to withhold compensation, but is there a way through education perhaps that we could have got you in the very beginning either through the Marine Corps or the VA through education? Yes, sir, I, I do believe so. Um, like I said, when I got back from Iraq and, and was in the Marine for, Corps for a few years after, I, I was really not aware of any sort of a program that I could do while I was a Marine and I had uh, really no idea as far as how that would look anyways and and there's definitely a, a certain amount of uh, pride that goes along with uh, you know admitting admitting that you do have that problem so when you're you're coming to work every day with a thousand other Marines it, it's kind of like you know does he know does he know is you know is you know you don't want to you don't want to feel like the odd man out so if, if there was much more openness at least when I was in the Marine Corps, to um, getting help and, and to at least talking about it or, or taking the initial steps into at least realizing that um, there, there is help, you have a problem, and it's okay to get it. And, and just maybe having some sort of more of an open communication line between the, the top heavies and on down the chain to, to the, you know, the you know, privates, PSCs, whatever, um, that, that it's okay to get help and here's the way to do it and you're not going to be looked down if you do we encourage it it, it happens uh, I think I think and I, I think it's pretty safe to say that if anybody goes to combat they're changed for the rest of their life so it, it just sometimes there's more um, you know more cases like myself that uh, you know aren't quite uh, able to take it as well so um, it, it's definitely based on the person but I know if there was probably more of an open communication line between between myself and the higher-ups I would have been more apt to get help sooner. You indicated that everybody's changed in the military service that's true but it's also dependent upon the amount of stress and combat and what you see and you know judging from what your opening statement is you saw a lot and all that impacted you in ways you didn't know until it almost got too late um, so in a way the VA has a responsibility but in a way I think you're saying the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force, the Merchant Marines all have responsibility to at least let the people uh, who in combat know that it is not a sign of weakness if you feel you're struggling. Yes, sir, absolutely. And that before you discharge, this kind of message should be presented to the soldier so he or she knows that it's not a sign of weakness, just realize that you have this option and so that everyone doesn't think it's a liability on your part. Absolutely, yes, sir. And I feel like it, it would be just as important to, to get that communicated with the families of, of veterans coming back, uh, of Marines. It, you know, if, if I'm not willing to get help, then the pressure from my family, once they know from the chain of command that, you know, there's an open forum, if, if, if they're having these issues, nightmares, if they're drinking a lot, you know, talk to us, and, and it's okay that they're all right. We're not going to look down upon them. We're not going to you know, withhold a promotion, talk to us. It's okay. He's a Marine. He's done, done this. But keeping that open line communication between the, the military member and then their family as well, because if that person's not apt to go, their family 
is going to be the biggest reason that forces them into it because oftentimes I believe it's the family that gets them in and not the actual individual service member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Barkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Hansen. Thanks for your service to this nation and for your courage to be here this morning. Uh, I just have one question. You mentioned that the biggest obstacle that you had was getting past yourself and understanding and realizing that there was a need there for help. Yes, ma'am. Now, something in Teen Challenge versus the VA system, there was a difference in those two programs. What what was it with the Teen Challenge that let you get past yourself that was missing in the VA's, in the VA's approach to mental health? Well, ma'am, I believe it was really just, um, it was a couple things. One, uh, the environment was where, which I, which I mentioned earlier, was it wasn't a bunch of, uh, you know, combat veterans. It, w it was, you know, it was people that, you know, are from, from all, all over the state and that had different experiences but all had problems. And, and we could talk about our issues and, and they, they were very different, but yet they were the same. So there was yeah, a sense of, uh, it was a lot easier for me, I, I feel, to let go and, and talk about my issues with people that didn't know exactly what I went through. And, and I think also in, in my time at Minnesota Teen Challenge, I felt that it was much more, um, I wasn't just a number going through a revolving door. I felt like I was a person that they loved and that they cared about. And they wanted, regardless of what they got paid, regardless of what, uh, they wanted to see me better and they wanted to see me better for my family, for my kids and, and, and it was, you know, in the faith-based part of it. W once I was getting better, you know, ultimately hanging on to that religion, hanging on to God is, you know, has a plan for me. God has a reason for me to live and although I went through some of the things I went through, there's a reason for it and, and I can be used and I, I can be loved and, and, and that's, that, that was a big part of it as well was the faith-based aspect that really led me to believe that, you know what, even though, you know, everything that happened, happened, I'm loved and I have a future and there's a plan for me. Thank you very much, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lamborn, any questions? Uh, my questions have basically already been asked and answered. I thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. You said that uh, Teen Challenge wanted you to be better. Yes, Mr. Chairman. You think the VA wanted you to be better? I do, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I just feel that it was... Um, I don't know if I want to say a, a generic sort of feeling better, if that even makes sense, but I feel like it was much more at Minnesota Teen Challenge. It was, uh, it was much more... Personal? Yes. Yeah, it was much more. Thank you. It was much more personal, yes, Mr. Chairman. You said that even though VA screened you positive for PTSD, never mentioned any option for immediate care, and there was no immediate action on their part? No, Mr. Chairman. I actually got screened the first time, and they said that I was fine. And then uh, in a follow-up appointment, they, they just gave me a random survey in which I answered positively to on several questions on a scale of 1 to 10. And then they, they uh, sent me a follow-up letter that said, you, you seem like you might have some PTSD issues, so we'd like to do a follow-up. Then I did a follow-up. And uh, they suggested some outpatient things, but they didn't uh, suggest anything really um, on a larger scale. So again, I, we all have voiced our opinion. We thank you uh, for your service to our country, your courage to testify before both the Senate and the House. Uh, we appreciate what you're doing, and you're making a difference. And with that, we thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I ask the second panel if they would to uh, begin making their way uh, to the uh, table. Uh, Dr. Karen Seal, a clinician and a researcher at the San Francisco Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Uh, General Terry Scott. Uh, the general is the uh, former chairman of the Veterans Disability Benefits Commission. And uh, Dr. Sally Sattel, president resident scholar at the Inter American Enterprise Institute and uh, we thank you all uh, for being here with us today. 
Uh, let's begin with uh, Dr. Seal. You're recognized. First, I just want to recognize Mr. Hansen for his uh, bravery and courage coming forward to tell his story, which, you know, as a clinician at the VA, I hear weekly, and it motivates me to do the job that I do. It also motivates us at VA to figure out how we can better individualize treatment. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank him very much. Good morning, uh, Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Filner, and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify today. I will begin by placing my comments in context. I am a primary care internist based at one VA facility, the San Francisco VA Medical Center. In this capacity, I direct the Integrated Care Clinic for OEF-OIF veterans. The clinic at the San Francisco VA Medical Center is novel in that it offers all new OEF-OIF veterans a one-stop, three-part initial visit with a primary care provider, a mental health clinician, and a social worker. The integrated care clinic providers are all integrated and co-located within the primary care clinic and are trained to address post-deployment health concerns. I am also an associate professor of medicine and psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, and in this capacity conduct clinical research that is focused on gaining a better understanding of the burden of mental illness in OEF, OIF veterans who use VA health care. Based on my experience as a clinician and researcher, I offer my perspective first on the mental health problems of OEF OIF veterans who use VA health care, second on utilization and barriers to VA mental health services, and third, current efforts by VA to overcome barriers to mental health care for OEF OIF veterans. I conclude with some thoughts about how VA might further meet the mental health needs of the several hundred thousand men and women who have served this country and deserve the best care possible. Rates of mental illness, but particularly rates of PTSD among OEF OIF veterans enrolled in VA health care have increased steadily since the conflicts began in 2001, closely followed by increasing rates of depression. According to the most recent data released by VA in January 2011, over 300,000 OEF OIF veterans, or 51% or one in two veterans, has received one or more mental health diagnoses. And 27%, more than one in four veterans, has received diagnoses of PTSD. Our research indicates that not all veterans have been affected by war in the same way. Younger, active duty veterans are at particularly high risk for PTSD and drug and alcohol abuse, whereas older National Guard Reserve veterans are at higher risk for PTSD and depression. Rates of depression, anxiety, and even eating disorders are higher in women than in men. Female veterans who have experienced military sexual trauma are at four times the risk for developing PTSD as women who have not experienced military sexual trauma. Appreciating these subgroup differences in OEF, OIF veterans seeking VA health care will help VA better implement more targeted interventions and treatments, as well as guide future research. In 2007, the Institute of Medicine determined that only two therapies for PTSD, prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy, had sufficient evidence for the effective treatment of PTSD. Both therapies have been endorsed by VA, and many VA mental health specialists have been trained to deliver these therapies to their patients in mental health clinics. These therapies require a minimum of nine or more sessions, ideally spaced at weekly intervals. Our research showed that 80% of OEF OIF veterans with new PTSD diagnoses attended at least one VA mental health follow-up visit in the first year of their PTSD diagnosis. However, unfortunately, less than 10% of veterans with new PTSD diagnoses attended a minimum number of sessions within the time frame required for evidence-based PTSD treatment. We found that being young, less than age 25, and male, having received a mental health diagnosis from a non-mental health clinic such as primary care, and living far from a VA facility greater than 25 miles away, were all associated with failing to receive adequate PTSD treatment. Because adequate evidence-based PTSD treatment may prevent chronic PTSD, VA needs to focus on developing interventions designed not only to improve initial engagement in mental health treatment, but also retention in care. Patient barriers to mental health care among OEF OIF veterans include stigma, logistical barriers, and even the symptoms of the mental health disorders themselves, as you heard today. 
Avoidance and PTSD, apathy and depression, and denial and self-medication with drugs and alcohol may prevent veterans from seeking care. The persistence of battle mind mentality, in other words, continuing to think that symptoms like hypervigilance are as adaptive rather than problematic after returning home has also prevented many veterans from seeking the care they need. From a system standpoint, VA has not always been able to keep pace with the growing demand for specialty mental health services. System barriers include shortages of mental health personnel trained in these evidence-based mental health treatments. There is a lack of universal access to video teleconferencing known as telemental health in which rural veterans can receive specialty mental health services at VA community-based clinics delivered by specialists based at VA medical centers. In addition to the barriers we hear about frequently from veterans, difficulties navigating the VA system to make appointments, lack of extended hours and drop-in appointments, and lack of services for families and children, which tends to differentially impact women, there are some other potentially challenging barriers to mental health care. For instance, while IT security is clearly important, excessive security concerns may be limiting the development of more novel internet and telephone-based mental health treatment options that would expand access to VA mental health services and appeal to this younger generation of veterans. In addition, privacy concerns about the Department of Defense's access to veterans' electronic medical records have discouraged some veterans from coming forward and disclosing more sensitive mental health symptoms, such as substance abuse and domestic violence. In fact, in contrast to the underutilization of mental health services, OEFOA veterans with mental health disorders disproportionately use VA primary care medical services. Capitalizing on this trend, VA might consider further restructuring VA services such that more specialty mental health providers trained in evidence-based mental health treatments are embedded within VA primary care. This may even involve infrastructure changes to existing medical clinics to accommodate the co-location of more specialty mental health providers in primary care. These structural changes could literally break down the walls that exist between medical and mental health services, overcome stigma, and narrow the gap between primary care and mental health. For instance, pre-scheduling mental health visits to occur at the same time as a veteran's primary care visit, as we do in our one-stop integrated care clinic at the San Francisco VA Medical Center, could make it more likely that patients will attend and be retained in mental health care. In addition, new clinical resources available through the VA medical home patient aligned care teams in VA primary care, such as nurse care managers, could be leveraged to facilitate engagement of veterans in mental health treatment. For instance, PAC nurses could act as motivational coaches uh, to remind or encourage veterans to attend mental health appointments while at the same time working with veterans on behavioral concerns or physical complaints that often accompany the mental health problems. PAC nurses could also provide veterans access to new technologies, such as the VA intersite, internet site My Healthy Vet, or smartphone applications such as PTSD Coach, to enhance access to online mental health treatment or treatment adjuncts. Finally, there is a need for more research to develop and test modified evidence-based treatments for PTSD that are better suited to primary care settings. In summary, OEFOA veterans have extremely high rates of accruing combat-related mental health problems. Despite this large burden of mental illness, many OEFOA veterans do not access or receive an adequate course of mental health treatment. Veterans with mental health problems disproportionately use VA primary care medical services. The VA has already made advances through the VA Primary Care Mental Health Integration Initiative, and more recently, the VA Medical Home Primary patient-aligned care team packed model. Thus, VA is now well positioned to take the next step and address many of the remaining barriers to mental health care by incorporating more specialty mental health services within VA primary care settings. In this way, VA can continue to work to meet the growing mental health needs of this current generation of men and women returning from war. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. General. It's uh, good to see you again, and you're recognized. Well, thank you, Chairman Miller and uh, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My oral remarks will be brief. I hope that my complete written statement can be included in the record of the hearing. That objection? Uh, 
I'm presently the chair of the Advisory Committee on Disability Compensation, uh, chartered by the Secretary and uh, in compliance with the Public Law 110-389. And this committee has forward reports to the Secretary that's addressed our efforts. Uh, our focus has been on disability compensation, on uh, the revision of the Vassar D, on uh, procedures for service members transitioning to veteran status with special emphasis on the seriously ill or wounded, and on disability compensation for non-economic loss, sometimes referred to as quality of life. Uh, recently, we've added a review of individual unemployment, a review of the methodology for determining presumptions, and a review of the appeals process and its effect on uh, disability compensation. Uh, my discussions with your committee staff included a request that I review the pertinent findings and recommendations of the Veterans Disability Commission that met from 2004 to 2007 and made 113 recommendations covering a wide range of veterans' disability issues. Specifically, I was asked to discuss the VDBC recommendation to integrate compensation, treatment, vocational assessment and training, and follow-up examination for veterans suffering from mental disability to include PTSD. The VDBC in invested significant time and effort in analyzing the then current methods of diagnosing, evaluating, and adjudicating the claims of veterans suffering from mental illness, including PTSD. The principal source documents that we use in analysis were those that you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, at the outset of the hearing, a 2005 report by the VA Office of the Inspector General, and uh, an Institute of Medicine study completed in 2006 titled Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, Diagnosis and Assessment. These studies and the testimony of veterans, family members, medical professionals, and VA subject experts provided the basis for six recommendations that the VDBC offered. The complete recommendations and accompanying explanations are in my written statement. The key recommendation of the VDBC was to change the VA approach to diagnosing, evaluating, adjudicating, and treating mental disability by establishing linkage among compensation, treatment, vocational assessment rehab and rehabilitation, and follow-up examinations. Uh, the, the purpose of the follow-up examinations would be to determine the efficacy of the treatment that's being undergone. The benefits of linking these factors uh, might very well enable us to reduce homelessness, suicide, and substitute substance ab abuse, as well as to evaluate the, the effectiveness of various treatment programs. Most importantly, it greatly improves the opportunity for a veteran suffering from a mental disability to maximize his or her future contributions to society, which is what we should all be about. I understand that this uh, recommendation is somewhat controversial in many circles. Uh, for one thing, it dramatically changes the role of the department in evaluating and, and treating mental disability. The principal arguments against the linkage are that it will be viewed by some stakeholders as a mechanism to reduce disability payments, that it differs from how the department addresses physical disabilities vis-a-vis -vis mental disabilities. Both of these arguments can be addressed with carefully written and explained regulations and policy directives. Uh, the VDBC offered a recommendation that uh, offered a, a, an approach to uh, compensation that recognizes the relapsing and remitting nature of, of these illnesses. Regarding the differences in approach to physical versus mental disabilities, there's significant evidence that individuals with mental disabilities are less likely to seek and maintain a treatment regimen than those with physical disabilities. There is, of course, a resource bill that accompanies an expanded treatment mandate, and uh, the committee was aware of that, and as I'm sure most of you are. However, the VDBC recommendation to link compensation, treatment, vocational assessment and training, and periodic reevaluation offers an opportunity to reduce homelessness, suicide, and substance abuse, abuse among the veterans. Such an approach should offer some long-term health for mentally disabled veterans and improve their chances for integration into the society. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, I'll be happy to respond to any questions you may have uh, now or at the, as the hearing goes forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Dr. Sattel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee for the invitation to be here. 
My name is Sally Sattel. I'm a psychiatrist who formerly worked at a VA in West Haven, Connecticut, and now I'm a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. <clears throat> In the current system, as we've seen and has, as we've been discussing, a veteran can receive disability compensation <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for a psychiatric condition that's never been treated. A straightforward approach to bridging this gap uh, and the kind that uh, uh, General Scott have, <coughs> has been focusing on um, is an urge, of course, to integrate VBA and VBH so that ref, ref, uh, claimants are referred for treatment. I'm certainly not the first to suggest this. But integrating compensation and care, while a definite advantage over current practice, does not address the timing issue. That is, whether veterans necessarily benefit when the disability claims process can precede care. And that's what I fo want to focus on now. Uh, we have to consider the fact that compensation before care, that kind of a sequence of granting disability claims before a veteran has been treated, can sometimes have significant drawbacks. For one thing, it is very difficult for a compensation uh, manager, comp and pension manager, to make an accurate assessment of a veteran's future function, that is, whether or not he or she will continue to be disabled in a way that imp impairs employability before treatment and rehabilitation has taken place. As clinicians know, not everyone in pain with symptoms or a diagnosable mental health disorder is going to be disabled, that is, impaired in terms of future workplace function. Beyond the matter of accurately judging functional impairment, <coughs> which has, I've been saying is, is kind of hard to do as a CNP manager without the person being in treatment and rehabilitation first, <clears throat> there is the possibility that with our current sequence of being an, uh, allowed to uh, uh, receive and file disability claims before treatment, that despite the best intentions of this system, awarding disability status prematurely, especially at levels that indicate unemployability, can actually complicate the veteran's path to recovery. Now consider the example below based on an actual case. This is a young soldier, we'll call him Joe, who was wounded in Afghanistan. He has classic PTSD. Noises make him jump out of his skin. He's flooded with bloody memories and nightmares. He can barely concentrate, and he feels emotionally detached from everything and everybody. He's 23 years old, about to be discharged from the military. He's afraid he'll never hold a job, he'll never integrate fully and, and function fully in society, and he uh, applies for total disability compensation from the DVA. And on its face, this seems quite logical, and granting those benefits seem quite humane. But in reality, this is probably the last thing that this young soldier turning veteran needs. And what I mean by that is that compensation at a high level can confirm the fears that, in fact, he will remain deeply impaired for years, if not for life. I mean, now, that's a sad verdict for anyone, but it's especially tragic for someone who's only 23. You know, imagine telling someone with, a spinal, someone with a spinal injury that he'll never walk again before he's even had surgery or physical therapy. Now, a rush to judgment, as well-meaning as it is, about the prognosis of psychic injuries can carry significant long-term consequences insofar as a veteran who is unwittingly encouraged to see himself as seriously and chronically disabled risks fulfilling that prophecy. Why should he even bother with treatment, he might think, which of course is a terrible mistake because this period soon after separation uh, as a veteran is quite is young, uh, is when the mental wounds are most fresh and when they are most responsive to therapeutic intervention. But Joe is told he is disabled, and he and his family may assume, typically incorrectly, that he will never be able to work. He'll no longer be able to work. This becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in many cases and ending up depriving the veteran of the of, of work itself, which has enormous therapeutic value. It's also quite demoralizing, and once a patient is caught in a downward spiral of invalidism, it can be very hard to throttle back out. 
For example, even if he wants to work very much, he understandably fears losing that financial safety net uh, if he were to get off the disability rolls. Now, of course, this suggests, everything I've just said so far, suggests a, a sequence that would begin with treatment and move to rehabilitation, and then, if necessary, the veteran would go on to become assessed for disability if he was not improving. But this can't be all. Any person who is too fragile for employment while he's in treatment will need to receive a living stipend. A treatment-first approach could not work with this. Excuse me, a treatment-first approach could not work without some sort of living stipend for the veteran and his family. Now, in closing, however this gap between care and compensation is to be closed, there are at least four important things to remember. First, there has to be sufficient information for the comp and pension examiner. He needs to make a good determination about ongoing employability. And without a course of quality treatment and rehab, there's often a not enough information to make judgments about disability. Two, except for total and permanent disability and IU status, reevaluations every two to five years uh, are uh, vital and also communicate the expectation of, improval, of improvement. Four, excuse me, three, uh, while a veteran's getting care, uh, neither he, she, nor her, the family should suffer economically. And four, we should try as best as we can to avoid premature labeling that downplay of disability, avoid premature labeling of disability that downplays the recovery prospects. It's reasonable and important to instill the expectation that most veterans will get better. They are changed by their wartime experience naturally, but that they will find a comfortable and productive place in the community and their family. Uh, finally, conferring uh, a high-level disability status upon a veteran and the chronicity of dysfunction that that implies before his prospects for recovery are known can make the long journey home even harder than it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, to tell you, uh, you raised the issue of prematurely granting disability compensation and, and caution against the, the perverse incentives that such a designation may have. Um, how can we balance the need to encourage early and effective treatment with the financial reality that many young service members uh, have uh, when they return from combat and are experiencing mental health problems. I think you may have addressed it from the fact that you said a treatment with some type of a statement. But could you uh, elaborate a little further? Well, that's that's the basic idea that that uh, there would have to be some sort of uh, living stipend. The important thing, in my view, is to not call it disability. It could be as generous, could be more generous even than, disabil than, than his disability rank might have been if he were uh, assessed for a claim right out of, you know, right off the bat without first getting treatment. That, that's not my concern. Uh, my concern is that the family and he not, not worry about uh, their support. That will impair his ability to get better. Of course, just that financial insecurity is so anxiety provoking. I don't see how anyone could get better. And the family shouldn't suffer at all either. <clears throat> but call it a wellness stipend, call it a treatment scholarship, call it something. But I personally prefer not the, the word disability has is so freighted now. Um, Frankly, uh, in the when I work in a clinic, because I've seen this in Social Security and also in the in the VA, that uh, I feel the language here is important as well. General, uh, your commission recommended periodic uh, reevaluation of PTSD every two to three three years. I think it was to gauge the treatment and effectiveness and and to encourage wellness. Did the recommendation extend to veterans of all eras? Sir, I would say that it does. I would say that uh, uh, we have an opportunity here with this young group of veterans to start a process that uh, we have not uh, chosen to begin in the past, but I would say that it probably should probably should apply to all. Uh, you know, I would be the first to say, and I'm certainly not a, uh, a clinician or, or a medical doctor, that Every case is different, and the clinician should be the person who decides is it every two years, three years, five years, or whatever. Uh, so it, uh, it's probably not a, uh, 
a cookie cutter approach, but it's something that I believe that could be decided inside the uh, in, inside the the uh, treatment part of EHA. Seal, in your testimony, you said despite the initial use of VA mental health services among OEF OIF veterans, retention in VA mental health services appears less robust. You also noted that compared to studies of civilians, retention in VA mental health treatment appears inferior. How do we improve it? Well, I think I laid out in, in my oral testimony some ideas for how to improve it. Um, we know that OEF OIF veterans are coming into primary care. They're coming into primary care for physical complaints, which often pain and other physical complaints often do keep company with PTSD and depression. So they come to primary care. We're trying to meet the veterans where they are, at least in our clinic. I think we run into difficulties when we separate mental health from primary care and we don't adopt a more holistic approach. Um, it is very difficult sometimes for veterans to come into primary care, seek care for their physical complaints, then have a separate appointment in a separate time in a separate building um, for their mental health complaints. Um, I think if we can bring the two together um, more holistically, I think veterans would be more likely to stay in care. I also think that sometimes it's difficult to come to the VA at all. People have jobs, they go to school, um, and I think we really have to be open to more innovative approaches to deliver specialty mental health care, and that's why I brought up the use of the internet, the use of the telephone, um, even iPhone applications that can serve as mental health treatment adjuncts. I think we need to, to broaden our vehicles through which we deliver specialty mental health care. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Seal, I, uh, I appreciated your specific recommendations and I think they have a lot of merit from my own experience. Uh, so much of the testimony that we get, people have had problems, suicides. Uh, Mr. Hansen, who was on the panel in front of you, uh, you, I don't know if you saw his written testimony, but each of the uh, suicide cases that occurred in the United States was preceded by attempts to go to the VA for help. And he used the phrase, turned away. Uh, they have to almost fight to get care. I just had a constituent who I was, they, he was fighting for months for them to take him seriously. Nothing occurred, he committed suicide. Uh, so once you get in, it seems, you know, you know, your reforms make sense. But what, what is going on? With the, 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 so, the testimony that we get, I mean, is it subjective or is that their, their impression? But what, even if it is their perception, it's obviously meaningful. Uh, why do so many people feel they can't get the help that they need when they go to the VA? I mean, it seems that all of the, 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 the cases that we hear about involve that in some way. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you raise a you raise an, a very, very important concern. Um, I do meet veterans who come into my clinic who do say that it was hard for them to figure out how to come into our clinic and yet there are other veterans who walk into the building, go to the combat case manager, are literally escorted upstairs, an appointment is made and in many cases they're seen the same day. Um, so there's a, I think there's a wide variation of experience, which isn't to say that it isn't tragic when one person is not able to get services and commit suicide, obviously. But by the way, in a, in, a, in a national system that we have, why is there such variation? <laughs> that is, don't we have common policies and supposedly common training? I think, I think there are common policies and I think there are, um, there are common standards, but I think there really are regional differences and I think that some VA VA facilities are not all created equal. We have VA medical centers, we have VA community-based outpatient clinics, and we have other types of VA facilities that are, don't even fall uh, under that description. And I think some VA facilities do not are not sufficiently resourced with um, outreach workers, with administrative staff to handle the influx of veterans that are coming in. I actually think we could use more um, combat 
case managers. In fact, at our VA Medical Center, I just learned that they're no longer called OEF, OIF combat case managers. They're now um, in some more uh, generic social service role. And I think it's exceedingly important that we maintain that particular position at all VA facilities so that we have um, VA outreach to communities. And when VA, when veterans come into VA, they're met with somebody that knows exactly what they need and can literally escort them through the process of enrolling through member services and then receiving care. Might supplement your written recommendations with looking at that aspect too for us. That would be great. Uh, uh, by the way, <laughs> we, we have we've had hearings in this room recently, and we will have more on employment, and we have hearings on PTSD. Uh, I mean, surely some of the uh, you know we have 20, 25 percent unemployment with our OEF, OIF veterans. Surely they could help on this stuff. What? We ought to be hiring them. I mean. They could get training in, in this, but, you know, the most important thing is that their brothers and sisters are coming in and they could help guide them. Do you think, I mean, there's a bigger role for people and you could work with them and get them some of, at least some of the training they might have to... I think that's an excellent yeah, idea. I think we should, we have a and, responsibility these kids to do that. But I think, again, we have to look at resources and at our VA there's a hiring freeze. I don't know. I, I'm not exactly. You know, what, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I've heard this in several places. There's a hiring freeze. I mean, we have the biggest problem we've ever had. We have given the VA more money than they've ever had. I keep hearing about hiring freeze. What is going on here? I mean, we you're, we're under resourced. You say. I mean, we have increased the VA budget every year for the you know as long as we've been here. And, you know, it's 60, 70 percent higher than it was just five years ago. What is going on? I mean, do you have any sense of that from where you are? Or? Well, I mean, I think it's important to look at where I'm a, I'm a primary care clinician and I'm a researcher, so I don't know that I can answer for VA. Yeah. Um, yes, and yet from our perspective, we keep pouring in money <laughs> and then everywhere there's a hiring freeze. Well, it depends where you want to spend the money. Um, the money has been spent to greatly expand the capacity of mental health services. So we're hiring psychologists, we're hiring psychiatrists. But what you're talking about is different. You're talking about an outreach worker, um, which is. Which uh, I mean, is I wasn't talking about it. you. Were, you said you have a hiring freeze. So who do you have a hiring freeze on? Well, I don't. I don't know if we're if there's a hiring freeze on everybody at the San Francisco VA. I know for clinicians there is right now because we have greatly expanded at least our mental health services capacity. That may not apply to um, to outreach workers. I actually don't know. By the way, what, you have joint appointments at the university and with the. Mm -hmm. What percentage of each is do you have with each? Um, I'm five eighths VA and three eighths university. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know uh, hospitals where there's one eighth VA, seven eighths university, and we say we have eight psychiatrists on, you know, on our staff when there's only one, which is also, I think, at this point in time, I mean, I, I never underrate the importance of research and, you know, in, in your daily, also, you know, your own integrated life, but with all this clinical need, seems that me we shouldn't be putting people on seven eights time and so if they want to do research let them do it but let's get a full-time clinician in there so just to clarify i am based a hundred percent at the va so i am i am partially supported by the university through my own grant funding but i am based a hundred percent time at the va okay. and all and interestingly all of my research involves access to mental health care for oef oef veterans I understand. I know universities where they're, it's the other way around. They're mainly at the university. Anyway, uh, Mr. Chairman, it seems here we have a heart of a problem where we keep thinking we're given the resources. We hear from the field and from people like Mr. Hansen that pe we just don't have the resources to do the job. So well, we've we got to figure out this. We did here yesterday, uh, you know, in our sexual um, assault hearing that we had where we thought dollars were being sent for security and we're now finding out that some of those dollars are being redirected and not going where it needs to be. So uh, obviously it's outside your lanes, but uh, it is an issue that uh, this committee uh, needs to address. And uh, thank you, Mr. Filner. Mr. Bilirakis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Dr. Sattel, um, with regard to your proposal, uh, are you saying the veteran will not seek the, the treatment, the disabled veteran, because uh, he has financial obligations and also maybe possibly because of a stigma? Um, and then, and then I want to also. Well, why don't you ask that question? Uh, why don't you answer that question first? Well, the reason for the uh, um, the reason for the financial stipend would be because if we expect people to be in treatment, and even if the possibility uh, was endorsed of actually requiring it, I know that's very controversial. Meaning requiring it as a as a condition of being considered for disability, we certainly can't expect someone to be in treatment uh, intensive care uh, before. It, intensive care that a either takes up a lot of their time where they would otherwise be working or that they are simply not fit to work you can't uh, expect that of them without without uh, providing income support that's yeah, and I definitely need uh, definitely we we have to have this type and if we go forward with this uh, the other question is how long uh, what kind of a time frame are you talking about as far as determining a person's disability rating if you can answer that question as well. I guess, it, does it depend on an individual case? Or? Definitely, definitely. Okay, but, but can you give me a, maybe a time frame, approximate time frame? You know, for some, uh, for some individuals it, it, who are very impaired at the time, um, it could take up to a year. For others, it could take a, a, a few months. Thank you. Can I ask the panel if they wanted to give their opinion whether this proposal has any merit? Uh, you're welcome to uh, to respond if you'd like. Um, I think it's an interesting proposal. Um, I, immediately, I think I was struck with just something that I know clinically, and that is I know that when um, a veteran is ready to come forward for treatment is probably the best time to treat them. And I, I'm a little concerned about the potential for coercion or the sense that, well, it's now time to get treatment and we'll pay you to do it, and they're not truly ready or receptive for treatment. I was struck with our previous testimony that when he was ready for treatment, he found the right treatment and he responded to it. And I see that over and over again. I don't think that people all um, develop PTSD symptoms at the same time um, since, since they leave the service. I think there's a natural history of PTSD. I think some people develop it immediately. Some people it can take years to develop. People are ready for treatment at different times. Often you hear a hitting bottom phenomena. So I worry about sort of an institutionalization of of treatment or semi-coercion or payment for treatment, um, just some, some concerns. I'm not saying that it's a bad idea across the board, but I think we would have to give it a lot of thought to how it was implemented. Okay. General, would you like to speak on that? Well, I think we'd have to very carefully uh, lay out exactly how we were going to balance compensation and treatment. Uh, certainly the individual who is uh, clearly disabled, and I believe the secretary has the authority to, uh, to grant a disability uh, 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 in pretty short order on a temporary basis, and I believe he could do that. Uh, certainly uh, the, a stipend for, the, for someone who is uh, significantly disabled uh, while, uh, while undergoing treatment is required, as, as was pointed out. Uh, I think you have to be careful about forcing people into treatment who are not ready. But on the other hand, I think we have an obligation to try to be sure that all the people who are ready uh, are enrolled in getting the treatment. Uh, back to uh, uh, Mr. Filner's uh, comment earlier about people who uh, commit suicide or do things that, and, and then they say, well, we couldn't get treatment. So I think it's a, it's this is a complicated issue, and there's no uh, th there's no uh, one solution fits all. But I do believe that a a relationship between treatment and compensation and a, an assessment, which gets at uh, Dr. Seal's question, uh, and some follow-up evaluations can be worked out in such a way that it uh, it's beneficial. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Michaud. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Seal, uh, in your testimony, you pointed out that older uh, National Guard and Reserve veterans are at higher risk for PTSD uh, and depression. Can you speak to why members of the Guard and Reserves face this unique uh, mental health challenges? Well, I, I think part of it is the discrepancy um, that happens when you take an older regard, guard or reserve member who is established in their community or their job and there may not be as much training for them. You put them in a war zone, they may be less well equipped to be in that war zone than active duty personnel. Then they come back and are expected to reintegrate their, into their jobs, their communities, their families, and I think the disparity between those two worlds sometimes can be truly great and, and overwhelming. And I think that's why we tend to see that in older Guard and Reserve members as compared to younger Guard and Reserve members who may, who may be a little less established already in jobs, communities, etc. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Saitel, uh, when we talk about uh, PTSD, a lot of the focus over a number of years uh, has been, the uh, last few years anyway, is on, has been on uh, OEF, uh, OIF uh, veterans. Uh, you know, that being said, uh, that there is definitely a significant number of Vietnam veterans uh, with PTSD uh, from the Vietnam uh, War. Uh, are there, in your work, uh, have you seen any unique uh, needs uh, for the, us uh, addressing uh, the Vietnam veterans as it relates uh, to uh, PTSD compared to the OEF, uh, OIF veterans? Well, one thing that's very relevant, it seems to me, to people who are from the Vietnam era is that um, from a developmental standpoint, they are now entering the retirement phase of life. And that is uh, when a lot of folks, not just veterans, but a, a lot of people uh, feel when, when they finally retire, it's, it's, they're sometimes very excited about it, but it also can be a very stressful, dislocating milestone in one's life. And, and it's also coincident with aging and, the, and illnesses and your spouse getting sick. And that's a time where veterans uh, can be vulnerable to a, um, a recurrence of symptoms that have been dormant for decades often. And as I said, we often see that with uh, regular civilians where people get kind of, uh, you know, go through a period of depression and an existential kind of a dislocation at that time. Uh, in the case of veterans who had PTSD symptoms at one time, this is a period where we, should be uh, alert for for resurgence. It's treatable in almost all cases, and people do uh, regain their their footing. But it's a period that can be fragile, and we should be aware of that. Other, in, in order to address that issue specifically with the Vietnam veterans, what do you think the VA should be doing, uh, as far as should be doing different type of programs uh, or to address uh, that concern that you just raised? Again, that depends on what the person presents with. If they present with a severe major depression or a full-blown uh, recurrence of symptoms, we sort of symptomatically treat them, of course. But then it, it's more of, um, uh, but for many people, it's a kind of, it's a kind of psychological process where they come to terms with, uh, they have to figure out really how to start the second or third you know, part of their life. And uh, again, that's a sort of regrouping and uh, rethinking that, that many people go through. And those strategies uh, uh, are, again, highly individual. And you treat everyone you know, with their own <clears throat> situation. And you'd want to know what their interests were, you know, how people, fi again, find themselves in, in, uh, as they mature. Uh, just, frankly, uh, a competent clinician, uh, open-minded, uh, uh, should be able to, would, would think should be able to navigate someone through that, that phase. Thank, thank you very much. Would it surprise any of you at the panel, I was just looking over some numbers from 2001, uh, Vietnam era, era uh, PTSD, uh, claims or benefits, I guess, 106.
1,801 is the number of the base number. 1,010, the number now is 269,000. Does that seem inordinate to you? I'm sorry. Uh, any of you? Go ahead. Go ahead. I think there's a, a, a couple of factors that, that looked at by the VDBC and others. And one of them was the, uh, the recognition of PTSD as a disability. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, <clears throat> there, were a, there was a significant uh, number of people in and out of the military, in and out of the veterans community, who really thought that uh, PTSD was uh, somewhat of an imaginary disease that it, was, uh, uh, it wasn't there. And I think that over this period of time between 01 and the present, uh, it has become certainly uh, more widely recognized. Uh, this is not to say that there was never recognition during that period of time, because the clinicians and others, uh, there are a lot of books written and understanding. But uh, for the, the average person, veteran or non-veteran, uh, knowledge and understanding of PTSD is a fairly recent phenomenon. So that would be point one on, uh, on the increase. Uh, people suddenly realize, well, I've got, I, I have some of these symptoms. Or they would say, my husband has some of these symptoms. I'm going to get him in and get him, get him checked out or whatever. So I think that, that was a part of it. Uh, also, the, uh, the opportunity to receive treatment inside the VA, you know, in my judgment, increased dramatically over that period of time. And so, whereas in 2000, 2001, if a person had presented and said, you know, I've got this, I've got that, this is wrong, that's wrong, uh, it, it probably would not have uh, been sort of categorized saying, okay, well, these are symptoms of a, of a PTSD, some of them, so we're going to uh, get him uh, into a treatment program that uh, the VA now has, which was not present in the past. So, so that's two of them. Uh, there has also been, and uh, I say this somewhat, somewhat advisedly, uh, some amount of people who, as they reached a retirement age, were looking for uh, perhaps some other, uh, you know, they went through a crisis and they realized they had a problem and they presented themselves uh, to, uh, to the VA or to, to, uh, to medical authorities and saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm really doing poorly here. So. Uh, I think those are three aspects of it, but probably not the only three. And I defer to these uh, two uh, uh, clinicians here to uh, either amplify that or to refute it. <laughs> sounds right. <clears throat> Very good. Uh, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the panel for being here today. I. Um, as a veteran myself, I uh, have great concern about our young men and women that are coming back today uh, experiencing uh, PTSD. I've, I've long maintained that uh, there's one uh, segment of our society here in America that, that we uh, owe entitlement to, and that's our veterans. Uh, it's it's vitally important when they come back. I mean, they're coming back today with um, experiences that uh, uh, most of us cannot imagine. Uh, they've seen their friends uh, uh, killed. They've seen their uh, friends uh, dismembered, uh, disfigured. Uh, maybe even they've suffered that themselves. And yet we uh, uh, we continue to debate. Uh, as the chairman and the ranking member have said, uh, we continue to have these questions over and over and over again about the adequacy of the care. Um, you know, the, the veterans, one of the things that help them most when they get back is, is family support. Um, Dr. Seal, are there, are there specific programs that reach out to the families of these, uh, the veterans that have PTSD? 
uh, to to help them understand how to deal with uh, with their loved one who's suffering. Um, um, well, I can speak on you know most most uh, most informed about our own VA medical center. I do know that. Um, Nationally, nationwide, VA is putting a great emphasis on the family, on supportive families, um, and trying to educate um, families as to how they can help detect symptoms of PTSD and other mental health problems, and how they can help their loved one access care. So there is, very recently, there is a lot of emphasis being directed at the family from VA nationwide. Um, at our VA, we have a very robust um, family counseling program, and I, I really am, am very happy and, and pleased to say that when a veteran comes to see me and expresses um, marital problems, um, problems with parenting, domestic violence issues, that I do have a specific place to refer them, and I know that they're going to, going to be taken well care of. And it's not just for the veteran, but it's also for the veteran spouse and or the children as well, which I, I don't know how unique that is, but I know at RVA it's there and it's a very robust program. And I do know that there is a lot of attention now in VA nationwide being paid to family support and the importance of the family. General Scott, um, uh, did, uh, did your commission look into uh, the family aspects in terms of uh, your study? We looked into the uh, the family aspects of uh, veterans' disability writ large. Uh, we looked at the uh, uh, some of the issues surrounding the quality of life of the veterans who had returned and uh, the impact of the of their quality of life or lack thereof on the families. Uh, we made some recommendations regarding uh, uh, family care. Uh, 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 I, I suppose that some of the things we did may have been uh, spade work for this uh, for the uh, Family Care Act that was passed here in the, in the last Congress. I would hope so. Uh, but in terms of looking specifically at uh, the impact of family members uh, on, on PTSD or the, the impact of family members of or when a when a family when a member of the family suffered from PTSD, we did not look into it, uh, it uh, directly. Okay, I, I, I will just submit that uh, uh, these veterans, they go into the, they volunteer. It's a family commitment. It's not just a veteran commitment. And uh, uh, I think we need to look deeper at the involvement of the family in their, uh, in their rehabilitation and their treatment. Just a, a quick question. You, uh, I, I heard, you know, nightmares, um, uh, flashbacks. Uh, to put these folks on a track to recovery and, and get them ready to go back into the workforce, they've got to be able to, to work, which means they've got to be able to sleep. Do you have any idea, uh, are there numbers out there that reflect how many of, of veterans with PTSD suffer from sleep apnea or, or anything like that? Um, well, sleep, sleep, did you want to make a I was comment? I to say that sleep disturbance is one of the most common symptoms. So unless, unless you may well have actual epidemiologic data on it, but impressionistically and clinically, it's, oh, the vast majority, I think, have sleep problems. It's part of the hyperarousal symptom cluster that you see with PTSD. So it's almost, I would say, hallmark for most veterans who suffer from PTSD. And sometimes if we can actually address their individual symptoms, particularly in primary care, such as sleep, we can help them be more amenable to core PTSD therapy by specialty medical. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Seal, I appreciate your evidence-based approach to this whole subject. Uh, it's important that we have a basis for what we uh, expend our resources on in treating veterans. So thank you for that hard work. Uh, what are your specific recommendations to improve retention in the mental health programs of some of these veterans? Uh, you gave some statistics about the drop, not, you didn't say the dropouts, but uh, people that stayed in uh, and people that didn't. What can we do to, or what could the VA do to, to help retain people in these programs? 
Well, I think I made some comments earlier about embedding more of the treatment where the veterans present, which is primary care. But I would also say that, you know, VA um, has done a lot to invest in the VA medical home and our PAC teams, which are patient-aligned care team, nurse care managers, who could actually be leveraged to make reminder phone calls, conduct a, a therapy called motivational interviewing over the telephone, send secure email messages to veterans to remind them of appointments, do even more than that over the phone, which would be trying to figure out what the barriers to uh, staying in care are. It's very difficult for veterans to stay in mental health treatment because honestly, these evidence-based treatments, particularly, particularly at the beginning, are not pleasant. It's not pleasant to go over and over your trauma many times and we tend to lose veterans at the second or third sessions where they just can't take it anymore and they it's really um, it's really important that we try to retain them in treatment because once they get over the hump recovery is definitely possible but we need to, to really leverage um, the staff that we have at VA such as our nurses our outreach workers to really help veterans stay in treatment wherever they are, whether it's primary care or specialty mental health treatment. Would you say that threatening to uh, withhold disability payments would be an effective <laughs> tool? I think that would be highly coercive. Thank you. Um, and, and I should add unethical, really. Good. Um, uh, Ms. Sattel, uh, or Dr. Sattel, thank you. Uh, the, um, one of the things you said was that compensation uh, before care can or may uh, complicate treatment and recovery. I'm glad that you used the, uh, the may in that statement because uh, every individual is going to be different. Uh, sometimes it might help, as in the, the case uh, of Daniel Hansen, who thought that might have been helpful in his case. But uh, I've heard that uh, some of the ho housing programs that require veterans to be in treatment and be clean is also a problem because it's a catch-22. If they're out on the street, they can't clean up. So uh, it would be helpful for a lot of them to have uh, ho housing provided even if they're using. Uh, and so uh, I think it's very important to keep that in mind, how individual this is, rather than trying to... Uh, say, well, geez, we need to withhold treatment or we need to withhold payments or anything like that, because that would be, uh, I think, counterproductive in the most cases or a lot of cases. Oh, yes. I mean, that sounds punitive, and that's certainly not the intent. In, in fact, some earlier, I believe it was a congressman, Bill Araka, said something about would you force, you know, forcing people. And um, no, I, I actually, what came to mind was. Uh, as the other uh, were answering that question, is that it seems to me if someone, uh, if, some, if a veteran felt in enough distress to want to come forward, I think he or she had a, a claim, and he may well, um, but if there was enough distress and pain to come forward uh, and engage in that, uh, in that process, then um, but at the same time, he thought, as Dr. Seal said, I'm not ready to go through re-experience, desensitization, you know, re-experiencing therapy, or I'm not ready to talk about my trauma, which parenthetically, I might say, sometimes I think we impose these kinds of re-experiencing therapies too aggressively. But the point is he's in distress. There's usually almost always a way to engage someone who's in distress. And uh, through uh, all kinds of things, how are things at home? What's it like being with your children again? Uh, the simplest things like that. What's your day like? How, you know, that's the kind of uh, approach one might take. We're not talking about forcing someone to go through therapies that they find distressing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even suggest that to someone who is a complete volunteer patient. We're not going to uh, have you confront uh, a, or, be, or participate in a kind of intervention that we felt was against your best interest in the short term. Good. I mean, what we're seeing here, even with the, our first witness this morning, was that treatment is most effective when... Uh, the patient is ready to accept that treatment, so it might be best for us to find a way to encourage the patient to get to that point and to make sure that the uh, um, treatment's available for anyone that is at that point. Definitely we want to engage. Actually, Mr. Hansen said so many interesting things. He mentioned the holistic approach, 
which uh, gets to the family situation that was, was earlier mentioned, as opposed to a constant drumbeat of emphasis on, on the military experience. Some patients like that sense of being back in a cohort of, of uh, fellows, so some don't. And again, I guess if there's one theme that's emerging from this is that is, there is so much individual variation, and that's always hard for policymakers to reconcile because they obviously have to come up with a, um, a more generic kind of approach. But th th there's ways to build room into the system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists this morning. This issue of, of a veteran being ready or someone coming out of the military being ready concerns me because I think if, if contact is made, if someone calls a clinic or shows up in an emergency room or talks to their primary care physician about symptoms, I think that the presumption on the part of the VA should be he's ready. I don't think we should wait for him to bottom out. And I'm concerned with what I'm hearing that the VA doesn't create that culture, that environment where there's degrees of readiness, but we're ready right at the beginning to address this issue. And the presumption should be that everyone coming home ha is going to suffer some variation of PTSD. That's just the reality of what we're, you know, what they're going through. And it seems to me that the VA should be prepared for that. The military um, state of mind, that I'm tough, I can deal with that. We all know that's the culture of the military, but the VA should be ready to address that and be able to get around it. And I'm concerned that, based on what we heard from Mr. Hansen, that, um, that maybe that's not the case. Dr. Sattel, do you want to comment on that? You know, when I was listening to Mr. Hansen, I was thinking there were so many other um, opportunities to, to uh, um, essentially, in, in, in his case, Im, Im, impose the kind of um, structure that he needed earlier than he got it. And what I'm referring to is the fact that, unfortunately, he was arrested, he said, a number of times. The criminal justice, there are veterans' mental health courts. Uh, there are ways to uh, take folks who are within the criminal justice system, because that's where there's leverage. I do a lot of work with drug addicted people, so uh, that's an actual entry point into treatment. And he could have been uh, essentially diverted to a drug treatment program. Uh, and then, it, it is, I mean, thank goodness he didn't leave um, Teen Challenge. But uh, under some of these diversion programs, you know, there are significant consequences for leaving and significant rewards in addition to recovery and, and reintegration to, in society. But another reward is, is that your charges are dropped when you uh, complete them. So that was one way for him to come in. <clears throat> another, another possible way, you know, in retrospect, this all looks neat. I realized this at the time. It's very difficult. But sometimes people who are incredibly out of control can be civilly committed by their, their families. That's difficult, but that can happen as well. And it's, it's very hard, and, and families are reluctant. I understand that. It's easy for me to say. But I mean, there are those kinds of mechanisms are already uh, used in the mental health system. I just, it seems to me the VA should be far more prepared and way out in front of all of this because, because of what we're seeing and, and the, the, uh, the evidence is there. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Sheldon. Yeah. I have another a question. I just uh, I really appreciated your comment. I think what you're saying is you want VA to be more proactive and, and even more aggressive in terms of trying to detect a mental health problem if it exists. And I mean, again, I, I go back to our model, which is really almost. I, I don't mean to use the word passive as opposed to being aggressive, but it's passive in the sense that all new OEFOA veterans who come into primary care see a primary care clinician for 50 minutes, then we literally walk them over to the mental health clinician who's actually a PTSD psychologist. They then see that PTSD psychologist for 50 minutes, whether or not they have screened positive for PTSD, depression, or alcohol use. We just assume that if you've been to a war zone, you may have something to talk about. And if you don't have anything to talk about, at least you can hear about services that may be available to you when you are ready to talk. And then they see the social worker to, to discuss any benefits that they may be due. So that's, that's a program that's in place so that there is no questioning, well, do I need this? Do I don't need that? They just get it when they come in. 
But if we listen to what Mr. Hansen said, he filled out a form. And based on that initial interview, that form seems pretty um, you know, black and white and may, may depend on his outlook that day. And I think there's a bigger picture for these vets coming home that, that it may not just be as simple as 10 questions on a scale of 1 to 10. Seems like the scope and the examination should go far beyond that. And as you mentioned earlier, perhaps a more holistic. Why are we separating mental health from the physical health? It seems to me we need to look at the entire health of that veteran and they all, it all works together uh, that he's healthy. Uh, just briefly, you heard Mr. Hansen talk about he felt that the VA system was not as personal. He felt that the staff maybe didn't quite care as much as he found in Teen Challenge. He felt that there was no accountability. That concerns me. Um, I don't know if we have time to get that question answered, but Perhaps um, if you'd like to comment on that very briefly, I would appreciate it. Um, I, again, I can only really comment from my own experience. And I, I feel like we, I, I can't speak for every clinician and every nurse and every clerk at VA, but I think we go the extra mile to try to reach out to veterans that are coming in. We know that every veteran who comes in, we know that it wasn't easy for them to get there, that it took a lot of courage to come to VA, that it's not always a pleasant experience, and so we welcome them when they get there. We acknowledge their military service, and we give them contact information. I give them my card. I, show, I give them my email. I know that I'm technically not supposed to email with my um, veteran patients um, because of VA policy, but if that's the only way they can reach me, that's how they reach me. Um, and I have a pretty close personal connection with most of the veterans who come and see me. That's really all I can speak for, but I know that my colleagues in our clinic share that same approach, and I've met clinicians from all over the country who are dedicated to, to serving these veterans. So. It's very tricky because um, PTSD by its very nature and some of these other mental health problems um, result in, in avoidance of care. It's one of the symptoms of PTSD and so there is a bit of a dance between the patient seeking care and the providers wanting to deliver that care and sometimes it takes a while before we can meet people where they are. And a lot of the, uh, the motivational work that, that we can do over the phone with veterans or a lot of the education, the psychoeducation we can give veterans can be very, very helpful in preparing them to accept treatment. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, many of you in this room have heard me say often that I am the, the, the staunchest supporter of the VA system and the harshest critic and that it is a zero-sum game, that if one veteran falls through the crack, that's one too many. Uh, I also, though, am, am, am pleased to hear people talking about evidence-based policy and practice. Uh, anecdotal evidence uh, is, is no way to drive policy. I would also tell the, if I could, to the, to the ranking member, I would say what's past is prologue. Our leadership of this nation told us that the conflict that Mr. Hansen was involved in would be weeks, not months, and that's how we prepared for it. And so the influx of veterans coming afterwards is a result of not preparing for that. We've been behind the eight ball for years, and we're trying to get there. Uh, with that being said, I certainly want to see us uh, using the best policy, the best practices uh, to get the best treatment uh, for all these veterans. I would, uh, I would tell my colleague from New York, I live a few hours from the clinic in, that's being discussed here at, at St. Paul. Are in Minneapolis and in St. Cloud. The St. Paul Clinic uh, treats 1,100 uh, inpatient patients per year. They have a 90% completion rate. Uh, we have the data that the evidence driven. Again, if it failed for Mr. Hansen, that's, that's a failure we can't live with. We have to do better. My point in this hearing is, is for us to focus on where the VA does well, uh, strengthen those. Uh, some suggestions that come up to me, pre-deployment and post-deployment assessments to get a better baseline of where we're going, some smart things like that. I also would ask uh, Dr. Seal, the, the VA Medical Center, and I attend these monthly, every month in one of them, unannounced, go in and talk to folks. Uh, in Minneapolis, for example, they have a geriatric psychi psychiatric team that uh, for 65 and older with complex age-related medicals, the uh, team provides outpatient mental health services. They bring multidisciplinary staff of uh, geropsychiatrists, advanced practice nurse specialists, and all of that. We are approaching this, aren't we, in some cases from holistic. Do you have that in San Francisco? Yeah. We have a geriatrics clinic. That's okay. How do you measure your success in your programs? How do we measure success? Um, not always, not always at the end of 
Uh, not always at the end of treatment. A lot of, a lot of the work that I do involves large national VA databases where we look at um, diagnoses. We don't always, we aren't always able to see when a diagnosis remits. Would it be safe to say that the VA probably has as, as extensive as data on practices and uh, treatments and outcomes as any place in the world? Would that be safe to say? I would, I would, I, I don't. Would you think it would be better than teen challenges research? Um, I, I think an outcome should we not be measuring these things I say that because I know it was successful Mr. Hansen definitely be measuring these things and I think individual clinicians within their within their individual therapies do measure um, PTSD symptoms at the start in the middle and at the end of treatment okay. do I have all, do I have access to all of that data not necessarily because it's confidential patient data but I think individual clinicians in VA are trained in evidence-based methods which do involve assessment pre and post. So we could have a pretty good idea if I said that the, the Minneapolis VA treated 15,185, could I have an idea of how many of those patients received at least some form of help and we could measure it in terms of getting back to work, uh, personal measurements of life satisfaction and those type of things. We could gather that data, couldn't we? You could. And should we be basing our decisions on how we expand programs, work on programs, change programs based on that type of data? I think you should definitely look at the data before you decide to make changes. And okay. And I'm going to... Uh, Dr. Sotel, thank you for joining us again. I've become very familiar with your work over the years. Uh, the case for coercion. Tell me just briefly. You have a, you have a work on that, and, and I'm glad it got brought up. I, I am very, I would say, concerned, if would be the right word, from a medical ethics standpoint, from a human rights standpoint. I've read your work on medical ethicists, too, and the, the lack of need to have those in a large. Am I mischaracterizing that? Yes, sir. You, you said to not have them in large oh, hospitals? Oh, no, no, no. With all due respect, I, I'm... Okay, explain to me, though, the case for coercion. Okay. Research-based case for coercion. Yeah, that was written about, uh, that was um, uh, a monograph I wrote a while ago, and it had to do with uh, addiction, and that was the context I mentioned earlier. And uh, so that we're talking about people who've basically violated the law. So it's a different population. You know? Are you applying this to this, though, this idea? You, you did put out the idea of possibly withholding benefits uh, as use in some ways. Is this not coercion? Is, is your policy what you're asking for on how we get people into this? Is it not coercion? Am I mischaracterizing that? Yeah, I'm actually setting forth various kind of options. One could be that uh, before we call someone disabled, before we call them disabled, they have to be uh, experience some good quality treatment and that's that's uh, there's a whole lecture on what good quality treatment is it sounds like you're doing a great job uh, but I'm talking about at the point in which we call someone disabled that's very different from not giving someone the kind of financial assistance they need and provide you know making uh, the kind of help that they need available to them so we're we not withholding really almost just uh, um, changing the conceptualization of of uh, when a disability claim itself, when the whole identity of being a disabled person would kick in. You know, we deal with slippery slope issues here all the time. Uh, what yeah. would stop this from crossing over into the physical issue? Um, because the issue we're discussing because, here is mental health parity, and I would argue that the chairman's point, mm -hmm. we've increased, we had to bring the VA in here and tell them they could advertise mental health parity has now been incorporated into law and those types of things. Uh, what, how, how would we not slip into this and say, uh, you know, that we're going to wait and see first if you can go back to work before we help you with that limp you got from being shot in the leg. Is that not a slippery slope you think this would take us on? I think the principles apply across the board. No one's talking about withholding help or withholding financial care. Again, it's the point at which we consider someone disabled. That's all. And you think we do that too much. Am I right in that? Isn't it uh, how the helping culture is eroding self-reliance? Some, sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't do it fast enough. I mean, you can see for every overdiagnosis, there's an underdiagnosis and a misdiagnosis. All these things do How would you occur. rate the VA, if you could, overall, how they care for mental health patients? I think the VAs that I've, my colleagues at VAs are obviously at VAs that are in, um, you know, associated with major universities. And I think they've learned a lot of lessons from the way, the, work, the, the way they approached the Vietnam era, which again was with the best of intentions. But there were things we learned that uh, um, I think we don't do now as much, which is to say now, well, things are so different also. Those, a lot of those uh, men, and, well, some women, but mostly men, you know, we didn't recognize that psychiatry 
didn't recognize it until 1980. And then the first center of excellence, I believe, didn't start till 1987. So by the time people showed up, they'd been sick for so long and often in a, what, there was a term for it, I'm not making this term up, it's called malignant PTSD that some of them had because the years of substance abuse and, and years of criminalization. So by the time someone appears yes. then, it's so hard to treat them. But we have a chance, and we are taking it now, with this new generation of, of stepping in, you know. Well, I appreciate that, and I think we concur on that, that the, the earlier before these things take hold, the, the better. But And it's also holistic in terms of physical, but I would argue it's also the employment issue, Definitely. everything else. So thank you for that. Thank you, Chairman, for the extra time. Thank you very much, uh, panel. Thank you uh, very much for being here today. We appreciate uh, your comments. There may be some additional questions that will be asked for the record. We'd ask that uh, you would respond if, if, in fact, some come your way. And thank you very much. Third panel to make their way uh, forward, uh, Ralph Ibsen, Executive Director of Wounded Warrior Project, Christina Ruth. National Acting Legislative Director for AMVAC, Grant from that site, Acting Deputy Patient Care Services Officer for Mental Health for the Veterans Health Administration. Thank you all for being here today. Mr. Ibsen, you're recognized. Chairman, <coughs> Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Filner, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting Wounded Warrior Project to testify this morning, this afternoon. WWP's vision is that this will be the most successful, well-adjusted generations of veterans in history. But critical gaps in VA's mental health system are compromising that vision in our view. The first large gap and Ms. Burkle made, made reference to it, is lack of effective outreach. Given the prevalence of PTSD among returning warriors and the risk that lack of treatment will result in severe chronic disability, it's concerning to us that VA is reaching only about one of every two returning veterans. In our view, VA should approach this issue, as discussed, as more of a public health issue. 2008, telephoned the approximately half million OEFOF veterans who at that time had not enrolled for VA health care and it encouraged them to do so. This was apt recognition in our view that we must be concerned with the entire OEF OIF veteran population. A single telephone contact is hardly an effective outreach campaign. Compounding lack of aggressive outreach we see Dr. Seal's data as very, very powerful and very disturbing. It tells us that enrolling for VA care and being seen for a war-related mental health problem does not assure that a returning veteran will complete a course of treatment or even return for a follow-up visit. Also troubling is that VA has set, very low, has set a very low performance bar for reversing this trend. Certainly, I think as evidenced by Dr. Seal and what she described at Medical Center at San Francisco, veterans are getting good mental health care at many places in VA. But I think it's, it's worth acknowledging that v, VA really operates two mental health systems, a nationwide network of medical centers and outpatient clinics, and a much smaller readjustment counseling program operating, operating out of community-based vet centers. In our view, the differences between these two systems explain why greater numbers of returning warriors do not pursue VA treatment and why many of them discontinue treatment. The warriors with whom we work consistently report high satisfaction with the Vet Center experience. The strength of the Vet Center program highlight the limitations of the larger system for many of these warriors. And our experience is following. Dr. Seal indicated VA medical centers passively wait for veterans to pursue mental health care rather than aggressively reaching out to them in their communities on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The larger system gives insufficient attention, in our view, to ensuring that those who begin treatment actually continue and thrive. No doubt it emphasizes, as was discussed, 
training clinicians in evidence-based therapies but it does much less to ensure that those clinicians really understand warriors' military culture and the combat experiences they've been through. And unlike medical center, unlike vet centers and, and unlike San Francisco, most VA medical centers fail to provide family members needed mental health services, often resulting in those warriors struggling without a healthy support system. In 2007, VA developed an important policy directive that identifies what mental health services should be available to all enrolled veterans, no matter where they live. But as VA acknowledged, this directive is still not fully implemented. Access remains a problem. Many of VA's small clinics have at best limited mental health staff. VA policy directs that facilities contract for mental health services where necessary to provide that care but those facilities have generally made only very limited use of that authority. PTSD and war-related mental health problems can be successfully treated, as you've heard this morning, and in many cases, VA clinicians and vet centers are helping veterans recover. But we urge that VA focus on closing what we see as serious gaps. We urge particularly that we look to the experience that, that veterans like Mr. Hansen has had. Mr. Hansen is the kind of veteran who could do extraordinary work in his community and other communities in Minnesota, reaching out, working one-on-one -on -one with other veterans and bringing them into treatment. Had he had a successful experience with VA, he would be a, an, a, an extraordinary salesperson. Unfortunately, he didn't have that, that positive experience. Likewise, in terms of sustaining veterans in treatment, in terms of dealing with that retention issue that Dr. Seal discussed, a veteran like Mr. Hansen would be a, a wonderful adjunct to a, a clinical team to work directly with a warrior, having the, the unique connection warrior to warrior that he has. Secondly, we would urge we would urge VA to launch education and training programs for its staff on military culture and combat so that the connection is, is a closer one, so that it's not a distant, uh, friendly clinician-patient relationship, as, as uh, Mr. Hansen described it. We'd urge that VA provide needed mental health services to family members whose own war-related mental health issues may diminish their capacity to provide support. And we'd urge that VA expand the number of its vet center sites and locate new ones close to near, near military facilities. We recognize the importance of robustly addressing the full range of issues facing returning warriors so that they can thrive physically, psychologically, economically. Compensation for service-connected disability is certainly an earned benefit and critically important to most veterans' reintegration and economic empowerment. Yet data from our recent from recent surveys we've conducted underscore that much more work needs to be done at the most basic level to achieve better coordination and unity of focus between VHA and VBA. For example, notwithstanding guidance suggesting that comp and pension exams may need to be as long as three hours to fully develop a PTSD claim, one out of every five of the warriors who responded to our survey indicated they were seen for 30 minutes or less. The committee has emphasized this morning the goal of a wellness-focused VA response to mental illness. One step in that direction, in our view, would address a problem identified by the Disability Commission regarding the individual unemployability benefit. We concur with their recommendation and that of the Institute of Medicine that individual unemployability should be re restructured to encourage veterans to re-enter the workforce. In closing, Mr. Chairman, while we recognize that VA has some excellent mental health treatment programs, our work with warriors highlights the gaps plaguing the system, gaps in a largely passive approach to outreach, gaps in access to mental health care, gaps in sustaining veterans in mental health treatment, gaps in clinicians' understanding of military culture and combat experience, gaps in family support, and gaps in coordination with the, vet, with the benefit system. We look forward to working with this committee to help close those gaps. Thank you, Mr. Ibsen. Ms. Madam Chair, 
Ranking Member Filner, and distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of AMBUTS, I would like to extend our gratitude from Beacon of the opportunity to share with you our views and recommendation at today's hearing regarding VA system of mental health care and benefits. You have my complete statement for the record, so today I will briefly discuss two areas of concern to AMBUTS. Sadly, suicide has become a too familiar casualty of war. Suicide among veterans and service members seems to become an epidemic with no end in sight. The rate at which veterans and active duty military personnel are taking their own lives has surpassed that of the non-veteran population for the first time in our nation's history. According to numerous studies performed by NIH, VA, and DOD, upwards of 43% of veterans having served in the recent conflicts will have experienced traumatic events resulting in PTSD or other invisible wounds such as depression. Left untreated, these invisible wounds have a devastating impact on the lives of those veterans and service members who suffer in silence, as well as their families. AMBETS believes one of the hardest and most humbling decisions a veteran can make is to seek care for their invisible wounds of war. However, often when these men and women reach out to VA for help, they are often met with broken policies, lengthy procedures, as well as an overall lack of communication between VHA and VBA. Moreover, these veterans who are brave enough to ask for mental health care are encountering a confusing and frustrating claim system entrenched in bureaucracy. Many of these veterans find VA to be more of a hindrance than helpful to their overall well-being and thus choose to forego the care and benefits they critically need. One of the initial experiences a veteran will have within the VA system is with a claims examiner. Thus, the response from VA to a veteran seeking care for their invisible wounds is a PTSD claims evaluation without a concurrent offer for treatment. Now, a potentially fragile situation is made even worse. VA agency affiliation of the examining claims representative may not be clear to a newly enrolled veteran filing their first mental health claim. Qualitative data suggests veterans who undergo compensation examinations report not understanding the distinction between an, evalu an evaluative claims examination with that of a mental health care treatment examination. Many veterans do not make the distinction between the VHA staff who conduct examinations and provide care to that of the VBA staff who decide claims and dispense benefits. To many veterans, they are both simply VA staff. For example, a claims examination focuses on data collection rather than addressing a veteran's distress. The compensation exam examiner may have to collect information about traumatic issues that the veteran is unprepared to address even in a therapeutic setting. In addition, a compensation interview often has more time constraints and the veteran may feel rushed coupled with the frustrations felt towards the claim examiner who must consider not only the veteran's perspective but also the alternative sources of data and may ask questions that challenge the veteran's version of events. AMBETS urges VHA and VBA to immediately address the current confusion between clinical VHA functions and that of forensic VBA functions. The lack of education being provided to our veterans is causing too many veterans in need to turn away from the life-sustaining care and benefits VA has to offer. And that second area of concern is with the non-compliance of numerous visions to current VHA directives, policies, and procedures addressing mental health care, more specifically VHA Handbook 1160.01. In September 2008, VA issued VHA Handbook 1160.01 defining the clear minimum clinical requirements of mental health services throughout the entire VA healthcare system. The handbook outlines policies and procedures related to suicide prevention, specialized PTSD services, 24-7 emergency mental health care, and over a hundred other issues directly re related to the treatment and programs of mental health care. VHA 1160.01 also clearly outlined the requirement that every VAMC and CBOT were to have these programs and policies in place no later than the last working day of September 2009 unless granted written permission by the Secretary. Immediately following this deadline, as required by the Military Construction, Veterans Affairs and Related Agency Appropriations Bill of 2009, OIG conducted a review of VHA's progress in the implementation of the requirements. In 2010, IG's findings on VA's progress were released and raised several serious concerns from AMBA, for AMBUTS. 
and that's found VA's failure to implement numerous critical parts of the handbook that are directly related to suicide prevention and mental health care to be unacceptable. And that's is especially concerned over the following IG findings. One, the lack of access to timely treatment within all visions regarding specialized PTSD residential care program. The current wait time for many veterans living in rural and remote areas is six to eight weeks. Two, VHA's lack of trained personnel to provide intensive outpatient services for the treatment of substance abuse. As, as we have seen today, substance abuse can lead to things such as homelessness and or aggravate symptoms of the invisible wounds for veterans not receiving the care they have earned through their service. Three, VA's limited availability of 23-hour observation beds for patients at risk of harming themselves or others. And finally, VA's failure to have the presence of at least one full-time psychologist to provide clinical services to veterans in VA community living centers with at least 100 residents. These are only a few of the numerous problems IG outlined in their report, and that finds it to be inexcusable and irresponsible that numerous VAMCs and CBOCs are still, in 2011, being allowed to operate in a state of noncompliance to the VHA Handbook 1160.01. In closing, AMBETS believes VA must hold these noncompliant VAMCs and CBOX accountable and start taking a more proactive approach to ensuring our veterans are receiving only the highest quality of mental health care they can provide. AMBETS further urges Congress to step up the oversight as it relates to the full implementation of the VHA Handbook 1160.01 .01 and mental health care as a whole within the VA health care system until we stop taking a reactionary approach to bettering VA system of mental health care we are destined to be playing catch up and meeting the needs of today's returning warfighters. Um, Chairman and distinguished members of the committee this concludes my testimony and I stand ready to answer any questions you may have for me. Thank you for allowing me to go over my time. Thank you very much for your testimony, Dr. Zeiss. Thank you. And uh, I am here accompanied by uh, Dr. Matt Friedman, the director of the National Center for PTSD, Dr. Mary Schoen, who is the acting lead for the new Office of Mental Health Operations, who will have significant responsibility for implementation and uh, and ensuring that policies are fully implemented, and um, and Mr. Tom Murphy from the Veterans Benefits Administration, and many issues have been raised. I'm going to actually do a very abbreviated oral testimony because I think you all have questions and want to, um, and I want to address many of the things that have come up. Let me uh, focus the testimony first on comments on a couple of earlier things and then on the call for evidence-based policy and, and uh, care within VA. I guess I would say first in terms of Mr. Hansen's testimony that the most moving thing to me and something that Dr. Seal addressed but I also want to address is his sense of not feeling a personal connection at VA. My own experience of working for VA for almost 30 years now is that this is the most passionate and dedicated group of professionals I can imagine working with and I've worked in academic settings and other settings as well and I would love to talk more with Mr. Hansen about his experience um, and, and think together about how to make sure that the passion we all feel for the work we do and for caring for veterans is being communicated directly. I also want to say that I uh, agree enormously with Dr. Seal's comments. In fact, most of the things she was recommending are, in fact, national VA programs. She was talking about them within the context of the San Francisco VA, but most of them are mentioned in the Uniform Mental Health Services Handbook. And in fact, the uh, integrated clinic for returning OEF, OEF veterans is present throughout the system led by Dr. Stephen Hunt and is staffed with mental health professionals throughout the system. I think it's an excellent way to specifically meet in the initial needs of a number of returning veterans. And then we have to stand ready to deliver in many ways beyond just that initial care. I would say, and I'm happy to talk with you, um, the OIG has closed all of its recommendations from the report that you describe um, as we have reported on further progress in implementation and they have agreed that those recommendations have been met 
and that uh, there's still work to do. We're still not at 100% implementation. Um, we can talk about that. Uh, we are absolutely committed to that work, but we're well beyond what was in that set of recommendations. We shared the same concern you did about making sure that things happened and things changed. A couple of other uh, things to comment on that have come up during the discussion. We have hired since fiscal year 2005 7,500 full-time mental health staff. That's mental health professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses, and social workers, but also addiction techs, outreach workers, support staff, a variety. And the number of veterans who are seen for mental health care has increased quite commensurately, going up from uh, in the less than a million, around 800,000, to over 1.2 million if we look only at specialty mental health care and up to 1.8 million if we're thinking about people who are also being seen in integrated care, primary care settings. Um, so we are very much expanding care and we are working, as Dr. Seal talked about, to deliver the most effective evidence-based care. We agree that we need to continue to lay the groundwork and ensure that more veterans receive those full courses of care. But we do have some evidence that people may not have been captured in the early time period her study covered up to 2008. But in fact, just as with substance abuse treatment, people often drop out several times before they then engage with a full course of treatment. And we are seeing some of those same patterns in VA. We're also developing increased tools to link people to care such as the mobile app that uh, for PTSD coach that Dr. Seal mentioned, which after two months has been downloaded as a free, um, a free app by over 10,000 people in 37 countries and is, has the highest possible ratings. Um, and finally, in closing, I would encourage you to look at a report that has been submitted to Congress, the Government Performance and Results Act review that VA participated in from fiscal year 2006 through fiscal year 2010 to look at the transformation of the VA system for mental health care in that time and point out that it concludes that VA mental health care was superior to other mental health care offered in the United States on almost all dimensions surveyed. These data speak to the great strides VA has made in mental health care. Clearly, we have more to do. We share concerns about many of the issues that have been raised. We're happy to talk about what are next steps, what are ways in which we can continue to, um, to act on our passion to serve veterans fully. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I will yield myself five minutes at this time for questions. Mr. Ibsen, in your opening statement, you mentioned that you there were gaps. Could you perhaps in order of priority mention the most glaring gaps and the ones that need the attention, uh, you know, our, our most uh, immediate attention. Difficult to prioritize, but um, I, think, I think you put your finger on a powerful point, which is that we should assume that all returning veterans are at risk of PTSD. And, and the fact that this is such a, per, you know, that untreated PTSD is such a pernicious, profound, can be such a pernicious, disabling condition, argues that a VA healthcare system not simply sit on a hill with doors open and a notice on its website, but that it actually engage veterans in their communities and bring them into treatment or somehow more aggressively pursue outreach, i.e. view this as really a, 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 public, a public health problem, not simply a treatment, you know, treatment when, you know, when veterans walk through the door. And I think secondly, the, you know, the concern with retention, asking the questions, why are veterans not staying in the system and exploring exploring in a more wholehearted way efforts to sustain that treatment. I think Dr. Seal spoke to a number of ideas. Our suggestion, which is actually 
uh, reflected in Section 304 of the Caregiver Law of last year, calls on VA to employ returning veterans to do peer outreach and provide peer support services. We think there is an important role for returning veterans who have experienced mental health problems and benefited from the excellent treatment that can be available to work with their peers who may be on the fence, who may be hesitant, who may be quick to drop out. And I, I would say those, those two of the more compelling ways in which we would we see gaps and, and would urge that they be closed. Thank you. Dr. Zeiss, um, yesterday we had a hearing, as, and the chairman alluded to the hearing uh, regarding sexual assaults. And one of the most compelling uh, pieces of information that came out from that, and, and you get it, a sense of it this morning, is that we can't count on every VA facility to be consistent. And so I'd like you to speak to that a little bit. You mentioned about the staff uh, that you're involved with, and, and I know Dr. Seals earlier mentioned her facility, but how can we ensure that the same environment is being created across the VA system? It seems to me that needs to be a priority so we can ensure it isn't dependent on the facility, it's dependent on the VA system as a whole, and they're giving our vets what they need. Well, I think that's a splendid question. It's one of the things that has consumed my energies since coming to central office because I completely agree with you that we can set important policies based on data, evidence, and what no, we know about gaps, and then we have to be sure that they are very consistently um, carried out. And I, I would like to turn to Dr. Schoen because one of the things that has happened just in the last few months is that VHA has reorganized to create this office of mental health operations that will be able to interact much more directly with vision directors, with facilities, and really tackle some of those issues very directly. So. Yes, um, just in the last few months, VA, uh, VHA has reorganized, and part of the reorganization has been to build in a uh, clinical presence in operations. Um, so the office that I'm with, the Mental Health Operations Office, is really charged with overseeing compliance of things like the handbook. So my first job, essentially, is really to ensure that that has been um, implemented in all facilities. As Dr. Zeiss mentioned, we're aware that it has not been fully implemented. We are concerned about that and we are directly working with the field in terms of identifying what are the barriers to implementations, what needs to be done, do we need to provide education, do we need to provide uh, uh, staff training, you know, what do we need to do in order to make sure that those programs are implemented as written. As well, we'll be looking at other areas of um, concern things that arise in reports like what you saw yesterday. So how do we collect that data and then ensure that the field actually implements the changes that we're advocating? Thank you. Would it be possible to get that reorganization plan to this to the committee? Certainly. We can we can uh, take care of that when we get back. Thank you very much. I would appreciate that. I now uh, yield five minutes to the ranking member of the Health Subcommittee, Mr. Michaud. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the panel as well for testifying uh, today. And, uh, and I've heard uh, you know, Mr. Hansen and I heard Dr. Zess talk about, yeah, the employees really do give that care. Uh, in reality, you don't hear that throughout uh, the country, quite frankly. Uh, there are the employees who do a really good job, and there are those that are there just can't wait to get rid of uh, this paperwork. Uh, and there is no consistency among uh, uh, the VA. We, I heard Ms. Roof talk about the fact that uh, VA employees aren't even following the handbook that they're supposed to follow, uh, which is, is a concern about uh, some of the problems uh, that we're seeing and the, the non-compliance uh, among uh, different visions and as far as they, um, how they move forward on these in particular uh, cases and, uh, and the problems that is causing uh, veterans as far as getting services, whether it's uh, dealing with female veterans issues as we heard yesterday when you look at uh, sexual assault and rape, 
uh, and the fact that the VA has not done a, a very good job uh, in, in that regard. Uh, when you look at uh, Mr. Hansen this morning, uh, talk about he, how he felt that he didn't get the service within the VA. Uh, and I've heard that complaint as well from a lot of veterans uh, uh, throughout the, the country. And I guess my uh, uh, question, uh, particularly when you look at mental health uh, uh, type issues for, uh, for doctor is uh, you heard uh, actually Mr. Ibsen mentioned this morning uh, about in this testimony that when the VA goes through their evaluation exams that it's extremely brief and superficial. Uh, how can the VA actually address these issues so that they're not uh, brief or, or superficial and they really give the care that the veterans really need so they will not get frustrated and try to go elsewhere because that's the problem I see is is veterans getting frustrating and not seeking the care uh, among uh, the VA. I mean where is the accountability within the VA system? Well several things in what you said so let me address uh, what I can and then come back to, to others as needed. First of all um, in fact, that we set a standard that veterans who are newly referred for mental health care need to be seen. Uh, they need a 24-hour triage call and, uh, and diversion to urgent care if it's needed, but the main standard is within 14 days then that they will have a full diagnosis and beginning of treatment plan. And we meet that standard by well over 95%. And we part of what contributes to not meeting the standard is veterans who decline to get an appointment within that two-week window. Now, in a system as huge as ours, with over 1.8 million veterans being seen for mental health care, there could be in that 5% that are not meeting that, um, a number of people that you hear about and that we are concerned about and that we believe we need to do better on. We would like to continue to do far better and we want to hear when there are instances where people have not gotten the care that the system is set up to deliver. In terms of the, the claims exam interviews, which is I believe what Mr. Ibsen was talking about when he talked about the, the brief, um, what I can say is that we have very recently had a study completed on PTSD interviews for, uh, for CNP claims. We will be hearing about the outcome of that research very shortly. I'll ask uh, Dr. Friedman to say just a bit more about that because he's been involved with it and we will certainly be very happy to share with you when that evidence is complete what the evidence is actually showing about what's required for a full, effective, accurate and valid PTSD interview and what policies we will set and how we will work with mental health operations to ensure that they're met. If, before you answer, I mean, I guess my concern is, is there appears to be a lot of studies and, uh, and evaluations going on and, and this issue is not new. It's been going on for quite some time and it's getting really frustrated because the other big issue that we hear uh, particularly coming from a rural state such as Maine is access issues. When Congress uh, adopted the Office of Rural Health we provided funding for the Office of Rural Health to really focus on the fact that about 40 percent of the veterans are, are live in rural areas that that office is supposed to focus on Office of Rural Health. However, when we, the GAO did her study to see how effective the Office of Rural Health has been, the VA can, uh, they can't account for over 51 percent of the spending that has occurred in the Office of Rural Health. How many veterans in the, uh, that the office is supposed to take care of have uh, been uh, treated? They can't account for that. So uh, I guess the accountability issue uh, is, is a big concern that I have because these are individuals' lives, they're, they're families and uh, I'm just tired of the study after study without really, uh, you know, really focusing on the problem. And the other issue that is a big concern is the fact that when you look at uh, the studies that do occur within the VA system, uh, that they don't include uh, individuals such as the VSOs, uh, uh, individuals who were really are affected by it as part of that collaborative effort. Uh, and that's a huge concern because if you have VA management in the, uh, uh, that's going to compose of 
the committee that's going to study, you got the same individuals, and they're going to go in there and try to collaborate and what have you. And, and that's a big concern uh, that I have is, is we're not really focusing on uh, the veterans who really need the help. And as we heard this morning in the different panels, uh, I mean, VA, don't get me wrong, I think VA, they do uh, a, a good job by and large, uh, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And when I get, uh, whether it's an Inspector General report or a GAO report saying the VA can't account for uh, the money that we're giving them and the, the effect that it's having, I mean, that is really uh, concerning. When I hear from veterans who are frustrated with the system and they go elsewhere for the help because VA is not providing that help, that is concerning uh, to me uh, as a member of Congress. And, uh, and uh, I hope, uh, Doctor, uh, that... Uh, that you take this hearing uh, very seriously and you really start focusing on getting results versus doing another study and reporting back to Congress. Because all too often what happens is after the hearing's done, unless we do have an aggressive oversight hearing, uh, you, know, you get that report done, it sits on the shelf, and that's the end of it until we hear another outrage uh, among uh, the veterans community. So. Uh, just getting frustrated with, uh, with I, what I see happening, and hopefully we can do a better job uh, than what we currently have had uh, over, over the past a few years. Well, certainly I'm trying to convey that, in fact, we're not just studying, we're doing. We've increased the number of veterans we're seeing for mental health. We've increased the number of mental health staff. We've increased the effectiveness of the interventions, and we are putting our, our passions into trying to make the kinds of changes in the VA system that you are frustrated about and that we want to see those changes too. And we welcome hearing when, you know, what are the places where we've not made um, the progress that you'd like to see. And it sounds like right now one of those is in doing these C&P exams. And I would really love to let Dr. Friedman, who is really our expert on PTSD, speak to that. Well, thank you. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, there was a meeting between VHA and VBA uh, uh, people to be to see how could we uh, develop a, uh, uh, a a standard uh, that could a, a floor so that no CMP exam would uh, would not meet a certain a certain criterion. And and one of the bases for that was that in in research and also in clinical evaluation. Uh, for years now, we've developed a number of excellent assessment tools, uh, some wonderful uh, diagnostic scales and other treatment uh, uh, severity scales that are, are not just used in VA, they're used universally, internationally. And it seemed to us that we had an evidence base for assessment that could very well inform the CNP process. Uh, and, and based on that meeting, a, uh, a study, which as Dr. Zeiss mentioned a few minutes ago, is, is nearing completion. Uh, was uh, set in motion uh, with examiners at different uh, <coughs> VA uh, regional offices uh, uh, throughout the country uh, comparing a standard uh, CNP exam with a CNP exam that used uh, a, a metric. Uh, specifically, we used the clinician administered PTSD scale, which is considered the gold standard for assessment, and the World Health Organization disability assessment scale, the HUDAS. Uh, which again is internationally uh, regarded, and so we have basically CMP as usual compared with with a uh, an, an evidence-based uh, uh, standardized assessment, and and those uh, encounters are are being videotaped. They're being assessed at the at the National Center for PTSD, and to stay tuned, we'll have the results uh, as as soon as we can get them written up. Let me just add finally, if, if I can keep my voice probably know we do have a mental health rural project going on in Maine and in Vision 1 as well as in Vision 20 and, uh, and 19, the most rural visions that we have. And uh, we are finding that there's some very effective things we can do in partnering with community and making sure that we are getting care more broadly into your system. And we'll learn from that to be able to spread to other parts of the system as well. We agree with you, it's really crucial. And the Office of Rural Health has supported us in doing that, but it's our Office of Mental Health Service that is really focusing that, that project in Vision 1. 
Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, first of all, I want to just um, reiterate and emphasize what my colleague and the ranking member um, has, has talked about, and that is the sense of urgency that lives are being lost and people are slipping through the cracks who need our help. And they are men and women who have sacrificed so much for this country. So our duty is, is even greater. So I would really encourage the Veterans Administration to work hard and diligently and, and give us an action plan as to how we're going to address these issues. The gaps that Mr. Ibsen talked about, that we talked about earlier, that shows that the VA is getting out in front of this. We're not just going to be reactionary. We understand, we appreciate the fact how these young men and women are suffering overseas as they protect our nation and, and what you're going to do to get out in front of this to help them. So I, I can't emphasize that enough. Time is of the essence. At this time, I want to take a moment to recognize the presence of Andrea Sawyer. Andrea is the spouse of an OIF veteran who has 100% service-connected rating for PS, PTSD. Andrea has been kind enough to submit testimony for the record outlining her observations of the VA mental health care system. And in short, she has made the following suggestions. Um, treatment must be timely and available. Treatment must be appropriately timed and tailored to address the severity of the symptoms. Treatment must be practical. Treatment must be culturally competent. Community options should be available. And communication between the VBA and the VHA need to improve. I would encourage all of my colleagues to read Andrea's very compelling testimony. And I want to thank Andrea for being here and for providing us with that testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? At this time, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material for the record on today's hearing. Hearing no objection, so ordered. This hearing is now adjourned.